see those lights up there? Uh, no. You don't see them? Dude, no. I, I gotta see what those are. I'll be right back. Astonishing Legends would like to thank Mint Mobile, Hawthorne, Cameron Hughes Wine, our contributors at Patreon.com, and you, our listeners, for making tonight's show possible. If you've been a long-time listener to Astonishing Legends, then you know that at this time of year, we've covered more than a few far-reaching topics that seem to strike a chord with more listeners than we expected. Since our first shows in October of 2014... We've touched on the ancient origins of the Jinn, Pukwudgies, the Hatman, and more. We've even dedicated full episodes to the Shadow People and Black-Eyed Children. The number of emails we've received after each of those topics, from people claiming encounters with these various beings, was, in a word, astonishing. In fact, those emails continue to this day. Tonight, we have an extraordinary episode for you. A compendium, if you will, of a wide variety of these characters. Inspired by a frightening book written by prolific author, international speaker, and frequent coast-to-coast AM guest, David Weatherly. Mr. Weatherly's book, Strange Intruders, will teach you more than you ever wanted to know about all of the unseen things that work to thwart the lives of the unsuspecting or stand around their beds at night while they sleep, just hovering. Weatherly has nearly two dozen books under his belt, including what some might call the definitive tome on black-eyed children, now available in its revised second edition. But tonight, we'll see how Strange Intruders touches on many of the entities we've discussed before, and some we haven't. We'll share a few of the most frightening stories from the book and speak with him about his lifetime of research, which has taken him all over the world in search of the origins of the unknown. Happy Halloween. Welcome back to Astonishing Legends. I'm Scott Philbrook, and this is Forrest Burgess. To believe or not to believe doesn't mean anything. Each thing in its own time. Pierre Fortunato's Enfreta. Join us tonight for the first of two shows on Strange Intruders with our special guest, David Weatherly. See, I got him tuned just right. Now is you now can't do that every time. Programming. No, I'm just, I'm just. I wanted to show you that I got him back online, and at least his his foibles, his his messed up programming, actually works for the tone of tonight's show. Uh, indeed, it does. Well, we are back, folks, and what an amazing show we have for you tonight. I hope it's dark and stormy wherever you are. But if it's not, at the very least, don't listen alone. Yes. Oh, and also, if you light a bunch of candles, remember to blow them out before you go to bed, especially if you're having wine, too, because that's just a recipe for disaster. <laughs> Always blow out your candles. And I, I have a great creepy story from a good friend of mine where she did a little positive affirmation kind of thing with candles, blew out the candles, went to bed, woke up in the middle of the night because the TV was blurring and the candles had been relighted. Mm. Yeah, pretty yes. scary. I like that story. Uh, well, <laughs> anyway, just a quick mention of a cross appearance that we recorded a few weeks ago and really had a blast with. We were guests on an Australian podcast called Float Your Boat, hosted by Brett Pattinson and George Sabados. Uh, we had a blast chatting with these guys from Down Under, and if you're not looking forward to our dark week coming up, then it's a good place to listen to us prattle on somewhere else. 
That really was a lot of fun, and it's out now. So look for the podcast, Float Your Boat, wherever you get your podcasts, which at this point, it's like they're spilling out of your electrical outlets, right? I know they are <laughs> in my house. I mean, all the apps and smart speakers, everything's listening to you and watching you all the time. I think you can just walk in your house and say, play Float Your Boat, and it might work. But uh, anyway, <laughs> it might. check it out. Uh, we'll have a link to the specific episode in our show notes, but we think you're going to like all of their stuff. Also, if you haven't checked out our new website, there is no better time than now because our wonderful Tess is posting a new blog entry daily this month for October's Blog Astonishing, and they will take you down a ton of rabbit holes if you let them. And you can find it at the top of our webpage to the left top quarter. Yes, and also for fans of the Midnight Library, Season 3 has begun over there and is being published on a more open schedule. The first episode has just released and is wonderfully dark. So look for the Midnight Library wherever you get your podcast as well. House, play Midnight Library. Hmm, nothing, nothing's working here. Uh, you know what, I should probably get a smart speaker. For yes, that yes, of course. Work, it doesn't, right? if there's okay. no speaker to receive. I see. Yeah, yeah. I see. <laughs> I wasn't sure how that worked. I just thought it was automatic <laughs> everywhere. Uh, all right. Just one more quick note for our patrons at patreon.com. Everyone over there at the $5 and above level will be getting access to a video chat session between us, Richard Haddam and Seth Breedlove about Seth's production company, Small Town Monsters, excellent new documentary, The Mothman Legacy, which of course also has an appearance by Mr. Haddam. We're recording that in a few days, hopefully. So once Scott gets that put together properly, we'll be posting that on Patreon. Okay, last note, Halloween merch is still up in the store. So if you want it, grab it soon. It'll be coming down in early November. Uh, just go to astonishinglegends.com and click on shop. By the way, our designer Kayla, who recently helped us overhaul our Squarespace website, says you really don't realize how nice these hoodies are until you get one. So she said we should probably point that out. So yeah, our apparel is nice. We, we don't do the oh. cheap stuff. Get over there and check it out. And yes, we're working on regular coffee mugs as they seem to be in high demand. People were wanting those, even though we have the insulated ones, which I think are cool. But uh, we're going to get some regular ones back in there. We're just uh, picking some out to, to print. We're so. working on it. We're working on it. Okay. Let's get into this episode. Well, I remember a few weeks ago, I wish it was farther back if we were better organized, when we decided that mm. we thought this would be a good show for the Halloween season. <laughs> you know, I know that we tried a few years ago to reach out to David when we did Black Eyed Kids, but I, I think right. we were like ships in the night. We never caught up with him or whatever. But uh, now we were able to do it. So I'm glad that he's able to be on tonight and talk about this book, which is you know, not even his newest book, is actually his newest book. He does these cryptid books uh, from different states. And this newest one is called Monsters at the Crossroads, Cryptids and Legends of Indiana. That one just came out in 2020. I have it here. I uh, can't wait to read it. But the book we're talking about tonight, Strange Intruders, published by Leprechaun Press in 2011. Came out a few years ago, but it's still relatively new. And it has a foreword by our good friend Micah Hanks, who's been on the show and, and produced the Cure Object stories for us. So uh, pretty excited about this. Yeah, and in classic Astonishing Legends fashion, I think this one unfolded how it usually does for our big Halloween topic, because we always try and pick something we think is just going to wow the audience and really get them scared and spooked and informed about something strange that they may not know uh, enough about, certainly after we talk about this tonight. I think this is important. I think people should know about this, whether you believe in it or not. A lot of people think this is what's really going on out there that no one really talks about or studies. So I think it's an important topic, but a really frightening one. And of course, we had some ideas lined up, but we weren't really sure which one to go with, which one is going to really deliver the timing of them all. And I think this one came serendipitously in that a review for this book popped up just uh, as we were searching around for information about other topics. I just saw the headline. It's like, yeah, I remember that book. It came out a few years ago, but what a great compendium of all the things that really frighten us. And I started thinking back, what were some of the episodes that really scared our listeners, that really shook them up? And yeah, it's Black Eyed Kids. It's Shadow People. It's these invaders, these intruders, as David calls them. You know, Scott and I always have these philosophical debates about what really scares people. And, and as I said, you can go to a scary location and it's going to deliver some scares. It may not. It may have a reputation. It may not pay out at all. And it's not really scary because you can choose not to go there. But with these strange intruders, they come to you. They find you. And I'm always reminded of that line in the Mothman prophecies, talking about the phenomenon, which is you notice them and they noticed you noticing them. And maybe that draws attention. And that's frightening. 
the people because this shows up right where you live and there's nothing you can do about it. And that's actually going to come up a lot tonight with uh, varying versions of these intruders, as David calls them. Look for that thread about what happens when you start to pay attention to them. But first, let's find out more about tonight's guest. David Weatherly has traveled the world to pursue ghosts, cryptids, UFOs, magic, and more. Going to dusty castles, remote haunted islands, ancient sites, as well as locations of more modern mysteries. In short, he's been in person to some of the most unusual places on the planet. Yeah, David became fascinated with the paranormal at a young age. But more than that, he counts his influences in the field as the folks at the top tier of research and information on it, including show favorite John Keel. Uh, he's also studied Jacques Vallée, Hans Holzer, and many others extensively as he developed his own ideas and methodology for investigating the unexplained. In addition to all this, he's delved into shamanic and magical traditions from around the world, making a point of locating and spending time with elders from every society and culture he could access, studying with Taoist masters in China, Tibetan lamas, and other mystics from the Far East. He's gathered knowledge from African and Native American tribal elders, too. And if this wasn't impressive enough, he's also deeply involved with energy-related arts, both studying and teaching Qigong and ninjutsu. Uh, oh, did we mention he's a magician as well? I mean, of course he is. Yeah, I, I think that's to be expected at this point. <laughs> <laughs> well, a published author many times over on topics ranging from hauntings to cryptozoology, UFOs, shamanism, and psychic phenomena with his own publishing company, Eerie Lights Publishing. And he's been a featured speaker at conferences around the world and is a frequent guest on Coast to Coast AM with George Norrie, as well as numerous other radio programs. Well, we're very lucky to have him on tonight to discuss his book, Strange Intruders. Uh, but he's also written books on listener favorites like Black Eyed Kids and a series on cryptids from various states around the U.S. So we'll have links to all of his work in the show notes. But first, let's welcome David Weatherly to Astonishing Legends. Well, David, welcome to the show. We are so lucky to have you. You've been on uh, so many uh, bigger and more popular shows than ours, so we appreciate your uh, returning our call. My pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> but you've been on our radar for quite a while because of uh, we covered the Black Eyed Children as a topic for uh, two Halloweens ago. And ever since then, yeah, we were dying to have you on the show. Yeah, and that was a very popular series, as was an episode we did a while back on Shadow People, all of which are things that we'll touch on tonight. Um, you know, we have lots of mutual friends, I guess, between Seth Breedlove and Mike Hanks. Uh, we feel very fortunate to have you on, so thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for asking me. Absolutely. So here, what is, here's one of my first questions, actually, as a recent, and our listeners know this about me, I've been in L.A. for almost nine years, been out of North Carolina for nearly 30. I only just got back about a year ago. But so are, are do you make North Carolina your home now? No, I still travel pretty extensively. You know, in general, I spend most of my time in the in the desert in the Southwest. You know, of course, the lockdowns changed everything the last, <laughs> you know, almost a year now. Yeah. And um, it's been kind of strange. I, I've still been traveling some domestically and working on projects, but it sort of rewrote everything this year. Uh, and I know it's been strange for everyone. You know, for me, I'm used to really staying on the move and, and working on different investigations and research projects. So to suddenly, you know, just not have access to a lot of things, it's been really kind of odd. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, you know, I've been staying on the move and, and, Working on more books. What part of the Southwest do you uh, favor when you're out there? So I love that part of the country, too. I've spent a lot of years uh, mostly in Arizona, uh, some in Nevada. Sure, sure. You know, it's hard to, to pick out one region that I like more than anything else because, you know, having traveled internationally and everything else, it's, uh, you know, I just love to have different experiences. Is the Southwest connected to any of your shamanic studying? Yes, it is. Well, you know, a couple of my earliest teachers were from the Southwest. So uh, as a result of studying with them, I ended up traveling to New Mexico and Arizona when I was fairly young. Do you ever talk about that part of your journey or? I do some. I, I mean, you see it referred to a little bit in Strange Intruders. Uh, I haven't done anything in recent years that is specifically targeted just to that. It, it's something, however, that is a vital component of my path as it's unfolded because it helped shape my worldview. And growing up in the South and, of course, being exposed to the, Christian, the Southern Christian mindset, uh, but then deciding to explore other types of traditions along the way, I think it's given me a very unique perspective in my pursuits of the supernatural. And in large part, that's because 
native traditions, you know, they just have a, a completely different idea of these weird things that the Western world kind of says, well, science doesn't accept that, or we're not sure this exists. And, you know, you, you go to native elders and, and, you know, I should clarify here that it's native elders, not just in the United States, but all over the world, because I've been blessed to study with a lot of different teachers from various traditions. And in general, you know, these older, uh, more magical and shamanic approaches, uh, they have this instant philosophy that oh yeah we know about this you know it's uh it's, it's part of the the world so to speak you know scott for a long time now i've wondered what next generation or who's going to pick up the torch passed down by researchers like jean keel and jacques ballet who's going to take up the mantle here and continue this important field research especially out in the field because that's harder to do these days. And there's certainly people out there, but, you know, getting to know David Weatherly here, he's the real deal. Yeah, I think what's really great is the longer we're at this, it's been several years now, we're starting to meet some really interesting people who are are doing the serious work. They're really out there in the field. Like you said, this gentleman has traveled all over the world studying all sorts of different disciplines, uh, religions, magic, various cultures, martial arts. It's like he's putting it mm -hmm. all together. And that gives him this unique perspective that he brought to his book. And tonight he's bringing to us. And one of the things that I'm excited about tonight, too, is this being the Halloween show and all is, mm -hmm. is there's some really freaky stories in this book. And we've <laughs> cherry picked a few of them that we're going to be sharing with you guys. So don't worry. We're going to get to that. We're going to get to the fun stuff. But we're also going to hear a little bit about each strange intruder from him before we share those stories, which he gave us permission to do. Yes. And to your point, Scott, I really do feel like this astonishing network is building. And it's really exciting, but it's also really inspiring in that the real field work is continuing to be done. And it gives me hope for the future of Fortean Studies. Well, it's time to talk about one of the first topics we're going to touch on tonight. Um, that's the djinn. And we are loosely following a chronological order to David's book, but we're not going to talk about everything in it. We don't have time to do that. And we highly recommend that you pick the book up and read it. It's uh, There's links to it in our show notes. Every single chapter is super fascinating. and has a lot of great stories in it. Yeah. If you are interested in remotely of any of these things that we talk about on the show, you need to get this book. Because not only does it touch on a lot of these characters that are just so weird and present high strangeness and high terror, it is really a comprehensive look at this. And also some anecdotes, they're just going to blow your mind. But definitely at the base of it, it's just really fun reading, we think. I'm just going to read the first couple of paragraphs here from the Wikipedia entry on them as a primer for everybody, if it's something that you've never heard of. The jinn, J-I-N-N -N in Arabic, also romanized as D-J-I-N-N -N, or anglicized as genies, are supernatural creatures in early pre-Islamic Arabian and later Islamic mythology and theology. Like humans, they are created with fitra, born as believers. Their surroundings then change them. Fitra is the state of purity and innocence Muslims believe all humans are born with. Since jinn are neither innately evil nor innately good, Islam acknowledged spirits from other religions and was able to adapt spirits from other religions during its expansion. Jinn are not a strictly Islamic concept. They may represent several pagan beliefs integrated into Islam. This is according to Wikipedia. I'm sure there's people that might disagree with that. Mm. In an Islamic context, the term jinn is used for both a collective designation for any supernatural creature and also to refer to a specific type of supernatural creature. Therefore, jinn are often mentioned together with devils and demons. Both devils and jinn feature in folklore and are held responsible for misfortune, possession, and diseases. However, the jinn are sometimes supportive and benevolent, which you'll hear David talk about. They are mentioned frequently in magical works throughout the Islamic world, to be summoned and bound to a sorcerer, but also in zoological treatises, as animals with a subtle body. Well, listen to this quote from the introduction to David's book. A long time ago, there were other ones here. They lived on the earth, just like we humans do, but they were different. They had different ways. When the people began to spread out across the land, the other ones didn't like it. They decided to leave. A great hole opened in the earth, in the side of a mountain, and those other beings, they went in. Then they sealed that entrance up from the inside. They can come back whenever they want to but we can't find the way to get into their world. We shouldn't try to find it anyway. It's a dark place. 
Yeah, so David attributes that, uh, or doesn't really attribute it, but it indicates that it was passed on from possibly a Native American elder, or it's told in that style, as right. it's, uh, I think it's a broad stroke of an origin story that's told in lots of cultures around the world from the time period, which is pretty fascinating. The other thing that's interesting to me about this is the common ground it has with the topic we covered a few months ago, the Pied Piper about the right. hole in the the cave. And there's, so there's yeah. a lot of the, the, the kids disappeared into it. There's a lot of that that goes around and you always have to wonder what was the seed for a story like that? Where did that come from? Was there some event of some kind that was the source for that story? And, you know, it doesn't have to be something supernatural. Maybe it was just a tornado and somebody never seen a tornado before. The tornado came and sucked a bunch <laughs> well, of people up and they never found them again. Yeah. Or maybe it was something more paranormal or supernatural and or otherworldly. This goes back to our episode about Edgar Casey in Atlantis, about beings that were here before humans. And then there was a mixing or a hybridization between supernatural beings and humans or proto-humans. Basically, the story is that what we think of as even primitive man today or even as the creatures we see being unearthed occasionally, there were beings before that here. And as soon as we started to muck up the earth, they hightailed it out. They were not happy with that. And as we'll talk about, it might be part of a grudge that is held by them still. Listen to this excerpt from page three of David's book, Strange Intruders, published by Leprechaun Press. They are able to travel vast distances in the wink of an eye live to be thousands of years old, and are not restricted by time or space. They possess knowledge far beyond that of humans. They can shapeshift into virtually any form, human, animal, tree, or even inanimate objects. They can take possession of living creatures and control both the mind and body of their victims. They can take the form of deceased loved ones and appear to be living in ghostly form or within dreams. These powers and more are part of the arsenal of jinn abilities, and it is why they are considered such a serious threat in much of the world. Just the amount of power, these like if these guys were in the Marvel comic universe, they'd be top <laughs> tier. Like there's nobody is going to be, able, the, these are the Thanos of, in well, this, let's not in this get world. that far. Well, okay, yeah. well, I'm just but, saying. But no, what, I, what I'm saying is that uh, what I've noticed about the behavior and the descriptions of this is that Yes, they have unimaginable powers. Certainly as human beings, we can't imagine our own selves to possess these abilities, even if you were a Doctor Strange-like superhero. And of course, it's very hard for us to imagine supernatural beings with these powers, unless you are one of the people who unfortunately thinks that they may have encountered one already. But on the flip side of that, Scott, I've noticed that there are limitations, as we've talked about since we've been doing this show. They're certainly not splitting mountains open or parting the heavens and uh, casting down uh, death rays onto people for mass destruction. They work in subtle ways. So with one of the themes that we'll see play out here, they do have abilities to mess with you, but they are in subtle ways, which, you know, of course, now rational modern science, the mainstream part of that, would say, well, there's nothing supernatural about that. You just have some condition maybe like sleep paralysis that's wearing you down, but we can't find anything wrong with you. So here, take some melatonin. But to the person, and they try Western ways to remedy this, and there's no relief, they try something else, which would be kind of way out there and alternative, and maybe it seems to work. So there are processes in play that seem to be beyond our, let's say, mundane rationale, our pedestrian answers, but they lie in ancient roots. And so to your question earlier, when did this all start to happen? When were the first occasions of this? Well, uh, if you believe in this line of thinking, this happened before humans came, it happened when they arrived, and it's going on today. David, your book covers a lot of strange intruders, and we're going to recommend that. Anyone who enjoys tonight's show, pick it up, because there's no way we can cover them all. But we, we did cherry pick a few to discuss, and what we'd like to do is talk to you about them in the order that they appear in the book, because you obviously put them in that order for a reason, and we'll get to that reason. But let's start with a topic that we've been wanting to cover for a long time, and I'd be lying if I didn't say I have some reluctance about it, frankly. But the djinn, the djinn seem to be one of the bosses of the paranormal world, maybe one of the most dangerous things to tangle with. So one of the things I wanted to ask you is, you know, with, with all of your time in the desert and in all of your travels around the world, do you think you've ever personally encountered the djinn? 
In terms of the gin specifically, uh, that's kind of a tough question. You know, I have spent time, uh, a friend of mine who was a Sufi, I spent time with him and other people from the traditions that accept the reality of the jinn, if you will. And, you know, there have been times that I've been on cases and they would report things that we in the Western world would maybe say, well, that's poltergeist-like activity or that's, you know, could be this. And, of course, the explanation from someone who has uh, a background rooted in Islam or even traditions that, you know, believe similar to that would say, well, this is jinn. You know, this is the jinn doing this. And it's one of the most fascinating topics. My very close friend and, and colleague, Rosemary Ellen Guiley, who passed away, in 2019, you know, she had delved into the gin quite a bit. And uh, she actually eventually backed off from the topic because she felt like they were such a danger, even to people looking into their activities, uh, that she decided to leave it alone. And in fact, before she passed away, she unpublished the best book that was out there on the gin, uh, one that she had written. She unpublished it. She unpublished it. She took it out of print. So it's still out there, obviously, but it's, you know, only used copies and they're, they're somewhat difficult to get a hold of. And she did that because of how she felt about the power, really, of these entities. That is part of the ancient lore of the jinn is that when you start to just mentioning them or when you start to look into them or investigate a case, they notice you and I was going to ask you, have you felt that yourself? Have you had any? Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> I have, okay. I have felt noticed by them. I, not a lot of people know this, but I, I have mostly written a book about the gin. This was actually put on the shelf a few years ago. And the reason being not because of feeling threatened unnecessarily by them, but because of something I uncovered that I really wanted to dedicate a whole section of the book to. And and I'm not trying to talk in circles here, but the long and short is that there's a specific thread about the gin that I discovered. And uh, there are some people that I've been trying to interview <laughs> for over two years now, and uh, they're not reluctant. They're just very difficult to pin down and, and get a, a face-to-face meeting with them. And once I do that, I probably will finish and publish this book that deals with the gin and the various aspects that I've discovered you know, with my investigations of them. But during the course of writing the the first, you know, three quarters of that book, I did have some very strange experiences. And for lack of a better word, almost poltergeist-like activity, you know, strange pounding on the walls. And this was in a home that was not haunted. You know, I had people around me who were close to me who were reporting strange dreams. And they didn't know that I was working on this project, but they would come and tell me, you know, about these things they were seeing in their dreams. And, you know, they would come and say, I don't don't know why I need to tell you about this, but I had this dream and it had this entity in it and here's what happened. And I would just kind of think, okay, you know, this is, I know exactly what this is because it fits all the other accounts. Yeah, definitely some very weird experiences working on that book. Would you then say there's a connection between that same aspect of not wanting to mention them or be noticed by these creatures with Native American skinwalker lore. Yeah, because, you know, ultimately, and here, I mean, we're already kind of going down the rabbit hole with this stuff. Yeah, (laughs) that's okay. (laughs) You know, if we take it in that direction, we could say, okay, sure, there are numerous paranormal entities, if you will, that have this tradition around them that says that if you start looking into them too closely, then they start to pay attention to you because they're either threatened or they're cautious about what you're going to find out, or they just want to know what does he think he's doing? You know, why is he looking at us? So, you know, you find that uh, certainly with the gin, that's a major component of the traditions that surround them. And when you speak to people from a lot of the Middle Eastern countries and other countries that have a, a gin tradition, they don't want to hear that term. They, they don't, you know, most of them are very reluctant to talk about the whole concept you know, they feel like if you say that term, it will invoke them and it, it will bring them into the home. So, you know, you find the same thing with uh, skinwalkers. You know, most Dene won't even acknowledge it. it you, you don't go walking onto the Navajo Res and, and start throwing that term around. <laughs> you know, right. but, uh, it, it's not going to go over well. But it, it's curious because even in more modern phenomena, you see this 
tradition kind of carry forward. You know, there was there was some of that type of thing that turned up in relation to the black eyed children. There are some occasions where it seems like if you focus too much on the men in black, they will in turn pay attention to you. So, you know, we get into this idea that there's some kind of a an overall consciousness that if you start investigating it, it's going to investigate you back. You know, it's, it's the old adage, if you peer long enough into the void, then things start looking back at you. Do you personally know of any cases where investigation into these beings went too far with some very negative outcomes? Oh, sure. There's arguably different cases that you could say, all right, you know, why, why did this happen to this investigator? You know, they started peering into this. Um, I've had people in confidence tell me that from looking at the gin, that very dire things started happening to them. It's perceived as something, certainly the, the gin are the most prominent in this field, because I'll tell you, a lot of these other entities that we're referring to, you know, they're sort of isolated in a sense. I mean, you're talking about skinwalkers. Yeah, it's a creepy topic and it's fascinating, but they're sort of centered in the American Southwest, you know, primarily around the Navajo Reservation. They spread out a little bit. You hear cases in, in Utah and other areas, but they're sort of localized, if you will. You know, the Black Eyed Children, um, it's a worldwide phenomena, but still it's, you know, there are only so many cases. We take a big leap when we start talking about the jinn because, you know, you have to realize that this is a tradition that is ancient. You know, this goes back to one of the core beliefs of this religious tradition. And I always point out to people in the Western world, it's almost comical, right? Because you say jinn, first of all, some people don't know exactly what that is. But when you explain to them, okay, you know, in the Western world, we would say genie. Well, a couple things come to mind, right? If if you're in my age bracket, you're probably immediately thinking about Barbara Eden, you know, uh, <laughs> popping out Me too. Of the bottle yeah. and, and bungling magic, right? Or if you're younger, you know, maybe you're thinking about the big blue guy from the Disney cartoons. But both of those are, are very deceptive in the sense that they're uh, giving us a, a somewhat comical representation of a topic that is extremely serious and and considered dangerous. And I always point out to people, look, you know, as silly as this may sound to the Western mind, uh, take a moment and realize that if a person is a practicing Muslim, they believe in the reality of the jinn. Because it's a tenet of Islam that if it's written in the holy books, then it must be real. Now, there's a great deal of variation in how they accept that reality. But think about this for a moment. There are uh, close to 2 billion Muslims in the world. The number is somewhere around 1.8 something, 1.8 billion. So, you know, to close to 2 billion people on this planet believe in the existence of the jinn. What does that alone do? Mint Mobile was the first company to sell premium wireless service online only, and now they're making it even easier to switch from your old overpriced wireless provider to them. Yeah, they've introduced their unlimited data plan for just 30 bucks a month. Let that sink in, an unlimited plan for 30 bucks. Yeah, why are you staying with that overpriced company when Mint Mobile has premium service at such a lower price? Well, I tell you what, I know that's a tough answer to think about for many of our listeners, but for a long time, I was that guy too. I hated getting my wireless bill for years, but I did nothing about it because there weren't any options. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean, brother. Opening that bill always produced an instant groan. But now our audience also has an opportunity to take advantage of this terrific offer. So uh, imagine what everyone could do with saving all that extra money every month. I know my monthly bill used to get upwards of $300 a month for my family, and I just felt like a fool paying that. <laughs> yeah, me too, because we knew there had to be a better way. I asked myself every month, what in the world am I paying for? This is like a used car payment, and I don't even get to drive a crappy car, let alone enjoy unlimited talk, text, and high-speed data. How they do this is so simple. By going online only, eliminating all of the traditional costs of owning retail, Mint Mobile passes significant savings on to you just by eliminating all of that overhead. Look, it's not practical to be without a smartphone these days, so you have to have something, but you also don't have to overpay for using it. Scott and I have put Mint Mobile to the test for a couple of years now, and we're 100% satisfied. We're never going back. 
But if you are not 100% satisfied, well, Mint Mobile has you covered with their seven-day money-back guarantee. All plans come with unlimited talk and text, plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Come on, it's time you broke up with Big Wireless like we did and kick them to the curb. Switch to Mint Mobile's premium unlimited data plan for just 30 bucks a month today. To get your new unlimited wireless plan for just 30 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash A-L. That's mintmobile.com slash A-L. Cut your unlimited wireless bill to 30 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash A-L. Hi, this is Martin. You're listening to Astonishing Legends with Scott Philbrook and Forrest Burgess. Now back to the show. Well, when if you were to try to explain what the gen are in a nutshell to our audience, how would you describe it? Yeah, so if you look at traditional descriptions, then the original description of the gen says that they were uh, created from a smokeless flame. So you sort of visualize, uh, you know, like a, some people see that as kind of a black fire. Or some people view it as plasma. Uh, you know, there's different representations that the modern mind could maybe wrap their heads around. But by the religious tradition, it's that three races were created, humans, angels, and jinn. And they aren't exactly demons. They don't really correlate exactly with the Western religious traditions. It's more that they're a, a separate race that kind of exists in between, because the lore says that they refused to bow down to the superiority of man. And because of that, uh, they were banished. Now, that banishment is very curious because it kind of follows a, a theme that I have discovered in a lot of cultures around the world. And it's this idea that there was another race of entities that lived here on the planet with us, and they left. They were either banished or they left voluntarily. It depends on the, the mythos that you look at. Uh, but we're talking about another race that leaves, and it sounds like they go through a portal. And they're here but they're in another dimension of existence. And uh, this kind of puts them right alongside with us. You know, it, it puts them in this strange netherworld that is not exactly where spirits of the deceased would be, but they're not off on some other planet or something either. It's as if they're in step with us, but vibrating at a different rate or, or existing at a different level that we can't quite perceive. And what's really fascinating, of course, is that quantum science in recent years is coming around to these ideas about these entities that are sort of looping back around to the ancient traditions and saying, oh, okay, well, yeah, we know there's other levels of existence. Uh, we don't know how to get there, but we know they're there. In your book, you mention uh, Nazim, if I'm saying his name right, is a Sufi? Yes. Is this the Sufi that you, is your friend or is this a different person? It is indeed. Uh, you know, he, he spent a lot of years, of course, the Sufi tradition is very uh, mystical in nature. And he spent a lot of years um, investigating jinn cases and basically kind of rescuing people who had tangled with the jinn in one way or the other, be that voluntary or otherwise. And, you know, what you find in a lot of these cases, of course, is that people um, are <laughs> sort of lured in by the idea of, oh, yeah, I can get this uh, powerful entity and, and it'll grant me wishes or it will you know, uh, something I can control. And these are medieval magical traditions that came to us into modern times that gave us this weird idea that, you know, if you find a bottle that's got a, a genie in it, it's going to grant three wishes. So what happens inevitably is that, well, <laughs> you maybe get uh, three wishes, but, you know, they're not apt to turn out exactly how you think they are because they have a distinctly trickster nature. To them, and, and sometimes that is a way of taking a jab at humans, and in other cases, it's something much more dire because, you know, by a lot of accounts, many of the jinn really dislike humans in general. So, taking any opportunity they can, they will cause very serious consequences to someone who's trying to demand something from them. In your opinion, why do they hate us so much? <laughs> why do they dislike humans? Why are they causing all these uh, problems? A and what is the nature of the trickster element with them? If you go back to the traditional Islamic lore, then 
it kind of makes sense because the legend says that because they wouldn't submit to the superiority of humans, they were banished. So it's that banishment that has caused their anger towards humankind. And in some other traditions, you could look at it and say, okay, well, yeah, they went off and, and lived in another dimension or whatever they've done. They exist all around us, but they're just troublesome by nature uh, in the view of a lot of people. So they have that trickster quality about them that is sort of straddles the line between being outright chaotic and troublemaking and on other occasions being somewhat of a teaching figure, you know, uh, kind of like Coyote in the, the Native traditions, you know, an entity that comes in and has these powers and does something, but, you know, it never really turns out uh, exactly the way it, it seems like it should. So by its very nature, it, it causes that trickster type of experience. It seems like the djinn could be a catch-all for almost every aspect of all of these strange intruders in some ways, or, you know, and what you just mentioned uh, sounds a lot like gremlins and there's other connections that, do you think that that's a possibility that the, the mythos behind the gen is, is possibly represents a, a good portion of all of the things you describe in your book? I think it represents a portion of it. Yes. But, you know, I'm always cautious uh, when someone starts pointing the finger at a particular explanation and saying, Ah, this explains it all. <laughs> right. I've been pursuing this stuff since the 70s. And through the years, this comes up on occasion, you know, that someone will put forth a theory and uh, usually well thought out uh, and say, okay, well, this kind of covers all the bases. You know, this is the aliens are responsible for all, for all of it, you know, or, or everything's a tulpa, you know, or these different concepts. And, you know, to a degree, I think it's necessary that we look at phenomena in that fashion sometimes, uh, just so that we can sort of thoroughly put it through the ringer, if you will. But overall, I don't think there's one specific explanation for all of these things that are happening. I do feel like there's an awful lot of interconnectedness. And ultimately, could there be an overall consciousness behind it all? Absolutely. I think that's the case. But, you know, we're probably looking at a much greater level of explanation when we get into that part. It's it's almost like trying to define God in some ways. So, you know, in terms of the jinn, I, I think that because they are shapeshifters, because they can take a lot of different forms, I think that they're an entity, a race of entities that are a lot more active than most people realize, especially most people in the Western world, because knowledge of them is just not that extensive, you know, in the West. But to say that they explain everything, no, I don't think so. Would you ascribe any significance to the variations when you when you talk about these different beings intruding upon our reality? Some seem to have more in common with each other than others. Like, how would you compare a general description of the jinn with the winged version, the ifrit? If we go back again to traditional lore, then <laughs> that's a whole different thing to dig into because really when you start looking at it closely, the jinn purportedly, you know, have families, there are different segments of their race, there are different classifications of jinn and so forth. And and it's you know, some of the stuff reads almost like a, a fantasy novel. It's very compelling to delve into, but you are kind of left shaking your head saying, wow, you know, this is like a whole planet of different aspects of this race of beings. So how do we really understand this? And the answer is we can't completely understand it. I think to a degree we just have to sort of lump them into this concept and first try to grasp what we're talking about in terms of what these things are, you know, what they may be. There was a couple of things that I thought were fascinating about your chapter on this in your book. One was the rock throwing, which, uh, you know, I've only ever associated with what are thought to be Bigfoot encounters. Um, and I, I wondered if you thought with people having rocks thrown at them when they're out in the wild or camping or whatever, and rocks are coming in from the woods, do you do you think it's a mistake to say that's a Sasquatch or a Bigfoot encounter versus an encounter with the gin? Well, you know, the rock throwing thing is kind of interesting simply because, yeah, a lot of people do associate that 
specifically with Sasquatch encounters. However, really, if you start looking at just isolating that phenomenon and going back further, then you'll find that there are much older uh, accounts of uh, that being associated with the jinn, but also with poltergeist encounters. So there's a lot of poltergeist cases where rocks were thrown, you know, just from nowhere and, it, and there was no clear sense of the entity that was pitching these things or, you know, rocks were thrown at a home and landed on a roof and so forth. I don't know if I can even go there saying, you know, yeah, this could explain Sasquatch. You know? <laughs> well, yeah, I'm uh, because, not saying that it would explain Sasquatch as much as I wonder if it could be a case of mistaken identity in this, in a scenario where you don't actually visually identify something. In the, in the woods, it certainly could be. It's going to depend on, of course, the area and you know a case by case uh, examination. But you have to realize that one of the aspects of the gin is that they're supposed to live in remote areas. Right. So you know a lot of these Sasquatch encounters take place in areas that are you know not really accessed by humans very much and um, would be considered very remote. So certainly in the Middle East and other countries that have a tradition of the jinn, you'll hear these stories about people being out, you know, in the desert or out in a remote area, you know, or out in, a, in an abandoned building or something, and rocks are being pitched at them, you know, just from nowhere. So, yeah, if that was happening in the forest in North America, people would probably say, oh, it's a Sasquatch. But in the desert of Jordan or something, no, they're going to say, wow, that's a jinn. So it's, it's one of those curiosities, I think, of a type of phenomena that crosses over amidst different purported entities and it's one of those things that has an investigator you know i have to kind of shake my head and say wow you know how do you take this puzzle apart in order to put it back together again and get a picture of what's really going on yeah uh well there are some particularly fascinating stories of servicemen deployed to the middle east somehow attracting the attention of the jinn in your book and we're going to share one of those but another thing we found fascinating was their prominence in india as well that's correct, yeah. In, India has a whole uh, tradition of the jinn. I, and a lot of people don't even realize that, you know, because, again, there's a, a distinct lack of information amongst a lot of Westerners about these things. Right. Uh, but these traditions are very, very widespread. And you do find them in India and, you know, other parts of Asia have jinn traditions. And, you know, just as we can say on the one hand, you know, the jinn are, are very contradictory in a lot of ways because, and on the one hand, we can say, okay, well, yeah, they, they lurk in abandoned buildings. They are found in the desert and remote places, you know, that humans don't tread. But then on the other hand, you can look at all these stories that will say, wow, they can live, you know, <laughs> I mean, they can take up residence in someone's attic, you know, or they can, or, you know, just like the old tradition, you know, <laughs> the terrible idea of the genie and the lamp, there is a tradition that they can be bound to particular objects, a gin can be trapped or attached to something, depending on your viewpoint, be it a piece of jewelry or, yes, a bottle or a lamp or, you know, a, a ring or a whole range of other things. Well, that was my question because uh, Nazim identifies that ring as being a problem in the one story mm -hmm. in your book. Right? And I was going to ask you, how did he figure that out? How did he just because of the type of object it was or does he have a more elevated sense of investigation when it comes to this that has involves a spiritual component as well? Some of both. Uh, you know, Nazim was always of the opinion that a lot of people who ended up tangling with the jinn did so because they got their hands on a cursed object, you know, an object that was that held a jinn. And this idea of uh, jinn being attached to objects really goes back to sort of the medieval period, you know, of magic, uh, high magic, and this idea of binding uh, demons or other higher entities to a piece of jewelry in order to carry that entity with you and to command it. So, uh -huh. you, know, it, you know, truthfully, it goes back even longer because you look at... Um, the tradition of Solomon in the Bible, you know, who commanded the jinn and, and bound them. Uh, so, you know, we've got this idea in uh, that's found in high magic that you can, under the right conditions, summon a uh, demonic entity or a jinn or something else that has certain powers and, and bind it to your will by trapping it. And that concept, you know, it's you don't hear about it as much, but it is still carried forth in parts of the world and you know i've spoken to people from the middle east who say that they do have traditions that they can summon a jinn and attach it to a piece of jewelry in order to uh, 
command that being and carry its power with them. Put it on a leash, as it were. Essentially, yeah. Which, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, leashing, that's trying to leash a mountain lion, you know, I suppose, uh, in the long run, because eventually it's going to turn on you. Do you think people to this day are trying to do that and getting themselves in trouble? And do you think we ever hear these stories in a more mundane uh, viewpoint connected to the news? Well, I absolutely know that it is because I've interviewed people, you know, even in recent years who, who have done this. You know, they've either purchased something or they've attempted to do it themselves. And, you know, if you ask about stories in the news, I mean, that, that's kind of hard. I, I can tell you there have been occasions that I've looked at you know, bizarre crimes and, and things that uh, get a lot of publicity and you think, man, there's something more going on there. What exactly was this guy doing or, you know, what was really going on here? But of course, without access to all the information of the case, it's, it's hard to really make a determination. So this was an interesting discussion about how gin, or as a spirit, can be trapped or stuck in something. Of course, here in America, we always think of Barbara Eden and, and I Dream of Genie. Yes. So get it? Genie. Yeah. Genie. The name and gin and genie. Very clever. You know, and again, it's male fantasy. Here, here's a beautiful woman stuck in a bottle, willing to do your bidding and help you out. But there are cases here where a gin could be trapped in an inanimate object. So in the stories we're hearing about, this object that the gin is either attached to or trapped in, it can be released from that item. So we're about to share the first story from David's book, Strange Intruders. And this story is told from the perspective of his friend Nazim, who is a Sufi. Now, Sufism is, uh, and this is from Wikipedia, defined as Islamic mysticism, the inward dimension of Islam, or the phenomenon of mysticism within Islam. It's characterized by particular values, ritual practices, doctrines, and institutions, which began very early in Islamic history and represents the main manifestation and the most important and central crystallization of mystical practices in Islam. Practitioners of Sufism have been referred to as Sufis. Before we get into this first story, which is not too long, listen to this quote from Nazim in David's book on the jinn. They often take their time lurking about and learning as much as they can about a person to decide how best to take advantage. If a person gains the attention of a jinn, then the spirit will not let go. It will follow that person and harass them until it achieves its goal. The goal of such a gen is often to drive the person to madness, or perhaps to cause death. A Silat teacher of my acquaintance from Jakarta told me his sister was cursed with a gen when the family moved away from Jakarta. There was a young man who was fascinated by my sister and had designs to marry her. She was not interested in him. She wanted to go to school and get a degree, and marriage, especially to him, was not in her plan. Within a week after our family moved, she became ill. She started to sleep long, long hours and we had much trouble getting her out of bed. She was taken to a doctor and they said it was probably a flu and they gave her some pills, but these did nothing for her. She began to look very pale and she would not eat much. Finally, our mother called upon a holy person. He said prayers over her and she reacted very strangely. He asked for her bags from the move. Some of them had never been unpacked. He started going through them, asking her about different items. Finally, he found a small metal box. He asked her about it, but she'd never seen it before. But it is in your things, he said. He opened the box and I don't know what he saw inside, but he closed it quickly. You have been cursed with a gin, he told her. I must take this away and deal with it. After this, my sister recovered quickly. She believes that the man who was in love with her slipped the box into her bags when he came to see her off. An act of revenge from a rejected man. Man, there is nothing quite so freaky as finding something in your personal belongings that you don't recognize, you did not put there. But it was a deliberate act. And, and that's my point, Scott. Here is an item you could say it's a fun bottle with uh, pillows and cushions inside. In this case, it was a box that Nazim opened and immediately closed it because he could recognize what was in there was not good. And you know what? I, I kind of want to know what he saw in there. I want to know what was in the box. And very strongly, I do not. 
Uh, yeah, it might have belonged to Marcellus Wallace from Pulp Fiction, but uh, <laughs> the gloves wasn't. Well, cool. that's <laughs> that's that's the MacGuffin of like the item. Sometimes a red herring where it draws your attention away, but it's not that important. But everybody wants to know what's in there. Well, this next story from David's book is a bit more intense. And this is the one we alluded to earlier about a serviceman. This particular gentleman served in the Iraqi conflict. And what happened to him is emblematic of what David spoke of both in his book and a few minutes ago about the jinn being connected to abandoned buildings and structures. This story is also told from uh, Nazim's point of view. And I'd like to read this other quote from Nazim. This is from page four of Strange Intruders by David Weatherly. Like a spider, a jinn will very slowly spin a web until it surrounds you. He will tell you what you wish to hear and appear as a helpful spirit. He will even tell you to pray and follow spiritual teachings. He will do whatever is necessary to draw you in until you are trapped. Once you go willingly, it is very difficult to get away. The jinn can drive you insane. In 2009, I was called on to help a man who was living in the UK. He was a former soldier and had spent time in Iraq before and after the fall of Saddam Hussein. When he got out of the service, he went to live with his new wife at a home in the UK. He wanted to forget about the Middle East. Things were not good for him. At first, he got a job with a friend from the service, but he had many problems and lost his job. He got another, but still had problems. He could not sleep because he would have constant nightmares, causing him to wake in a cold sweat. He became a very nervous person. He would be overtaken with a shaking, nervous motion in his arm. Doctors could find nothing wrong with him, and later it got even worse. The shaking spread to both arms. He had difficulty driving sometimes, difficulty eating even. Then it got worse yet again. He started hearing voices when he was awake. At first, it was just a few times a week, but they began to become more and more frequent. He would hear them at home, at work, everywhere. He started believing that he was hearing his mother who had died years before. The voices would tell him things that no one else could have known. But the number of different voices increased. He was put on medication, but it only made things much worse. So on his own, he came off the pills and consulted a religious person in fact, he tried several different religious people. Some of them helped to a degree because he found that after blessings or religious attention, he would be a little better for maybe a few days. One of the people he went to told him to look to the east because his trouble had started there. The suggestion was that he suffered a mental illness from his time there, but it gave the man another idea. He went to a spiritual person he knew was Muslim. This man told the soldier that his problem was most likely a jinn. This is the short version of how the man came to me for help. When I spoke with him, right away, I felt that jinn were involved because of the things he was suffering. I did some things to help him rest more. His health improved a little with the blessings. By our third meeting, I had him start telling me about his time in Iraq. I wanted to know about the things he had encountered, the things he had seen and experienced, and most important, I wanted to know if he had brought anything back. At first, he said no, uh, not really, just personal items and a few things I bought in a market. He showed me these items and nothing was suspicious. I continued to help him, cleansing the home, seeking answers, giving protective amulets to him and his family. Sometimes, one must be patient and wait for the jinn to reveal itself or for the answer to come another way. It was on our fifth meeting that things became clear. When I walked in, he was excited and he said he had to show me something. He brought out a small piece of cloth and sat it on the table. I had forgotten about this, he said. I found it in some rubble when we were clearing an area outside of a city. For some reason, I couldn't resist picking it up and keeping it. I stowed it in a small pocket and forgot about it. But when you asked if I had brought anything back, it kind of nagged at me and I knew there was something I couldn't remember. My mind has been so foggy though that I could not think what it was. Last night though, I felt a little better and I decided to go through all of my things again. That's when I remembered a small pocket and something I had tucked away. I carefully opened the cloth and inside was a small ring. It was not too fancy. There were three little stones set in it and the metal was worn 
It looked old. I would not say it was of particular value, at least not in terms of money. I knew right away that this was the source of the man's problems. I told him that the ring was connected to the djinn that was tormenting him. With his permission, I took the ring away and dealt with it. His health recovered, the voices stopped, and he began to lead a happy life. Well, one of the things that's amazing about that story, Forrest, is it reinforces the idea that the jinn can be anywhere. It, Nazim said in the book that he has assisted people in multiple countries. And also what makes them mad, I guess, is not being taken seriously by foreign cultures. <laughs> Well, so I'm, t- I'm just saying right now, I'm, t- I'm already a little nervous about how much we're talking about them. And I'm right. wondering if the fact that we're putting this out in a podcast and 100,000 people listening, it's kind of mm. like when the Sally House was looking at me, which I remember. It well, you know why? Because you didn't take it away. seriously. That's the point here. Well, I know. I said this, I guess I said this about COVID <laughs> back in March. Yeah. Is that you don't have to fear these things, but you should respect them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I see it the same as a shark or a bear. <laughs> As I said before, it's like when you're in their territory, you're in their house, you should be aware of them and respectful of them. That doesn't mean you shouldn't go hiking, but at the same time, you don't poke the bear, right? Because you don't know how they're going to react. So in my feeling here, are we treading dangerous waters? Well, I think if you look at it academically, it's okay as long as you don't dwell on it. Meaning don't start to try and communicate with these things in your mind you can look at it at a certain uh, distance and keep it there and be respectful in a way. Because I believe in some sense, it may not matter whether you believe in these things or not. You don't want to find out that you're wrong. That's true. And I, you know, and that, there's a lot of interesting stuff in David's book, by the way, that we're not getting to in the show about uh, King Solomon yeah. enslaving the jinn and having them work for him. And those are stories that I'm sure that religious scholars will be quite familiar with. I wasn't. I just thought they were amazing. So again, it's another reason to check out Strange Intruders because there's a lot more background in there. One other thing that he mentions in a lot of these chapters are the defenses. There are some defenses against the gen. I guess salt, iron, steel, silver, and one of my favorites, loud symbols, which then immediately made me think of the Zildjian Company, which I think is one of the oldest companies <laughs> in the world. So you got to wonder if there's is a it? connection there. Yeah. Well, look at all the older cultures that use loud noises to scare away demons, uh, firecrackers in China on New Year's to scare away demons and bad spirits. They seem to think that works, or at least it annoys them. (laughs) Here's the other thing about uh, what we learned in the sludge entity is that you may not have the power to dissolve something into nothingness, a a bad sludge entity or or a bad uh, demon you may not have that power, but there are ways to, it seems to annoy them so much they just go somewhere else, and maybe that's the best we can hope for. Uh, yes, and just a quick follow-up. Uh, Zildjian is almost 400 years old. It was founded in 1623 wow. in Constantinople. So, Holy cow. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. yeah. So that's, uh, hey, you know, just get a drum set and go crazy. You get a gin problem? <laughs> you, yeah. Th- yeah, the problem is that t- you're going to drive everyone else away as well. Well, I'm maybe that's okay. Practicing. Well, we're about to get into shadow people here. Uh, this is something our audience is going to be familiar with, right? Yeah, if they've either heard our episode or uh, have read about it now in popular culture, I think it is one of those things we're kind of alluding to the fact that even within the last four or five, six years now for us, covering these types of stories is that you're hearing more about these types of things. Like I had been aware of anecdotes about blacker than black, inky black shadowed figures that appear to people, but I didn't realize it was kind of a trend. Well, this is the other thing that we're realizing here with coverage of this book and our oeuvre is that there are different species of these otherworldly beings, but a lot of them have connections with each other. And that's also something we're trying to figure out. What are the similarities? How are they connected? Why are they slightly different but operate and have uh, the same characteristics as a lot of their counterparts? So it's all very interesting. But with, with shadow people, that could also be, let's say, an umbrella covering a lot of different types of entities that appear as a shadow or the black smokeless flame the misty cloud that soaks up all light around it. That's another theme that we're going to hear as we get to some of these other stories. It's not even the color black. It's the absence of all light and goodness, which appears to the eye as a bottomless, infinite black depth. 
moving further into your book, your next chapter in Strange Intruders is on shadow beings or shadow people, which is, again, I think, as we said uh, at, at the outset of this show or before we were officially on the air, we were talking about how we did an episode on these guys a long while back when we were, <laughs> I think it was in our second year, maybe, I'm not sure, but we still get emails about it. Like, I would say several times a month. It's one of the most popular subjects we've ever covered, and also the one we've gotten the most mail on, and it seems to be one of the most pervasive phenomena that happens to the broad section of the population, at least our listening audience. And we, of course, we did it at a time where we didn't know much about it. We were kind of debating. I had to pitch it to Scott to even cover it because we were thinking, well, maybe that is just sleep paralysis, and, and maybe it is somebody who took too much Sudafed who's seeing stuff. And, and, uh, <laughs> and then once you, the stories start coming in, you realize like, okay, there's much more to this. The stories are so varied, but there's a through line to them all. Yeah. I, Scott, I mean, how's your opinion of the subject changed? Well, it's changed a lot. I mean, I've read a lot, you know, and especially even in your own book, David, there's uh, stories of people who are seeing these things in broad daylight. And ha it's interesting how they start out in your peripheral vision. And then in these more severe cases, they are right in front of you. I was curious how specifically the section that you called the Gospel of John, how did you find this gentleman in this story? Because that story, that's one of the most frightening stories I've ever heard. To back up on uh, some of the comments from YouTube, uh -huh. I can tell you that when Strange Intruders came out, which was 2014 originally when it came out, um, in the aftermath of that book, I received more messages about the gin than anything else. Interesting. Uh, simply because, you know, there's just, again, there's not a whole lot of information out there. And, um, you know, so what was that, six years ago, there was, you know, even less out there. So, you know, I had a lot of people contacting me uh, with questions and with things that they were, you know, oh, do you think this could have been a gin or this, uh, so forth. But a close second was shadow people. And that was more from people who were, were writing me to say, I've seen one of these things, or I'm being plagued by one of these things, and so forth. The story you're referring to, uh, that's someone who just contacted me, and I had the story in my files for a while, and uh, it was one that I wanted to share because it is very creepy and very intense. And, um, you know, that was someone who had a very physical experience yeah uh, with the shadow people and you know in general most of these accounts that people share they're often feeling threatened by these things but you know typically they're seeing them in their peripheral vision or they're or they they see them head on but the things you know dart around or it's uh has i think you got stated you know sometimes it's in the night and they think it could be sleep paralysis or something else but they're seeing these things hang around their rooms so you know, it's a very wide range of experiences that people have with these entities. And the, and the descriptions, while they're similar, there are variations, too, because sometimes you have what's called the hat man, yes. you know, which is a, a shadow figure that's wearing typically like a fedora, although there are even variations of that. Uh, there's a few that they say, you know, he's wearing a cowboy hat or you know, something else. But then you, you have other people who say they're seeing a shadow figure that is left to find, even though it is, is humanoid in size. And then you know, maybe the creepiest of all, sometimes you get accounts that people are saying, well, it's, it's, you know, it's a shadow figure and it's completely blacker than black, but it has red eyes. Yeah, fiery orange, red eyes. There's always something about the eyes. And maybe there really is something about them being a window to the soul or lack of a soul. A mutual friend of uh, Scott and myself, specifically with their children, two children of theirs, years apart, had a sighting in the same bedroom of what the kids called a purple man. The parents, when they told us about it, uh, they didn't really know what to make of that because one child said, Mommy, who's that purple man standing in the corner? And then as uh, that child got older, they didn't see it anymore. And they didn't mention it to their youngest child, but the youngest child took over that bedroom and then at about the same age, once they caught up, also said to the mother, Mommy, who is that purple man standing in the corner? So I've heard various stories about different colored beings, some beings being totally all red or all yellow. 
or in this case, all purple. I think skin, including the uh, a cape sometimes, or regular clothing. Also the mention of horns. And then you wonder how ancient are these beings if they start to match Old Testament and Old uh, Hebrew and Old Islamic traditions. What's going on here? Have you heard of these types of color beings? And what do you think the significance of having a color is? I've heard a few of those here and there, and it's somewhat difficult to really distinguish how does this stand out, you know, more so from the standard, uh, if you will, shadow people encounters. Is it the person's perception, you know? Is it, um, I, I talked to one person who turned out that he was colorblind, and he was seeing this figure that he thought was, uh, gosh, I can't remember what color he was seeing now, but he wasn't seeing black, he was seeing something else. And he had a special condition where he couldn't see, you know, a couple of different colors. And it just kind of makes you wonder, you know, where is this registering in a person's perception, you know, that they are perceiving these variations of these figures? Is it within the witness or is it within the entity itself, you know, or is it something in between? Because, you know, some of these things I think at times are somewhat co-created. And, you know, if a person is already somewhat open, as they say, to perceiving things at a uh, different level, then, you know, maybe they're just in contact with something, if you will, that is trying to get a message through or trying to uh, create a specific experience. Because while a lot of these cases are very terrifying for the witness, there are plenty of them that are sort of almost mundane, you know, where people report, well, you know, I I've seen this thing. I don't think he's going to hurt me, but I don't know what he wants. He's shown up X amount of times in my home, and I can't understand what it is. And it's very curious because, again, this is something, it's almost the opposite of the jinn in the sense that where we can say the jinn are, you know, a specific type of entity that have a longstanding tradition and have, you know, if we accept the reality of the jinn, then we accept that as an explanation. With the shadow people, we say, okay, this is indeed a long-standing tradition that goes far back in history, but it doesn't seem to have one particular explanation. You know, it, it seems to be a phenomenon that can manifest kind of across the board for a lot of different reasons, you know, because sometimes these encounters take place in a location that's haunted. Uh, sometimes, you know, I've had people report to me, we, you know, we've got a brand new home. It was you know, it wasn't built on a cemetery. It was, you know, just uh, bare land for as long as, as recorded history. And, you know, the home is three years old, but now we've got this shadow figure. You know, what's going on? So it's another very puzzling phenomena, I think, that we have to take a very broad approach to and, and look at more or less at an, on an individual case-by-case -case view. John is a man of faith. He firmly believes shadow people are pure evil and connected to some demonic force. The devil, if you will. He further believes they appeared in his life at a time when his faith was at a low point and the trials of dealing with them put him back on a spiritual path. John says his personal experiences with shadow beings resulted from his lack of attention to his spiritual life. He reports he started encountering the shadow people once he stopped attending church on a regular basis. At first, the manifestations were brief, fleeting glimpses of shadowy forms seen from the corner of his eye. Over the course of several months, the sightings began to increase along with his sense of a presence within his home. He tried to brush it off and ignore it, but the shadows only became more active. He started seeing them in his direct field of vision, and they would boldly move across the room while he was eating or watching television. Still, he tried to ignore the incidents, passing them off as stress or exhaustion from long hours at work. It became harder to deny that something was wrong when the physical manifestations began. I would be sitting at my table and I would see a quick movement. Suddenly, a utensil would go flying off the table or something would fall off a shelf to the floor. One day, it was a bag of flour that just exploded while it was sitting on the kitchen counter. Another day, a dish flew out of the sink and smashed on the floor. I saw a shadowy form standing in the corner by the sink. I could have sworn that I heard something laughing. 
I was getting worried, but all I did was throw myself more into my work, figuring that it would all just pass, that whatever it was would stop if I was able to ignore it. John dealt with the shadow people in his home for a little over a year. His encounters escalated from simple, quick sightings of the dark forms to direct views of the beings. But soon, things took another turn for the worse. It was late September when John had a dramatic encounter that included a very frightening physical attack. I had worked late and then grabbed a bite to eat with a friend at a local burger joint. I got home about 9.30. By the time I looked over the mail and checked my email, it was a bit after 10, and I decided to head to bed. I went into my bedroom and sat down on my bed. I didn't turn the light on because the streetlights from outside gave the room some illumination. I kicked my shoes off and sat on the side of the bed a moment. I was just looking out the window at the trees when all of a sudden I felt something grab my ankles. It felt just like hands, one on each ankle. Before I could even think, I was yanked really hard and fell forward to the floor. I was on my stomach now, and whatever it was, it was pulling me hard, trying to get me under the bed. I turned on my side and moved a little reaching out to grab hold of the radiator that was against the wall. Thank God it was mounted firmly into the floor. I managed to get my other hand up, and I was now holding the radiator with both hands. I looked down towards the bed, and from what little light there was, I saw what looked like a man-sized figure under the bed, pulling at me. The two arms were projecting out from under the bed, but the most disturbing thing was that I saw two glowing red eyes looking out at me from under the bed. I started trying to pull my legs back, kicking them around and yelling at the thing to get off of me and to leave me alone. I felt desperate. I felt like if this thing was able to pull me under the bed, I would be gone. I don't know what I thought would happen or where exactly I would go. I just believed that I wouldn't be here anymore. I was always a fairly religious person. I grew up going to church and had gone most of my adult life. I had taken a new job that was very demanding and I simply hadn't had much time to devote to church. Now, in the face of this attack, I started to pray. I was calling the Lord's name and saying every prayer I could think of. I don't know how long I struggled with it. I'm sure it wasn't as long as it felt like it was. Eventually, I felt like the thing started to weaken. Then I hear what sounded like a growl coming from it. It only encouraged me to pray louder pouring everything I could into it. I truly felt it was my only defense against the creature. I was still kicking my legs, and I suddenly felt one of them break free. I pulled it up, and placing my foot on the floor, lurched forwards towards my nightstand. I had to let go of the radiator to do it, but now I held onto the nightstand with one hand, and with the other yanked open the drawer and pulled out my Bible. I held it up towards the creature and continued to pray. Just as suddenly as the attack had started, it stopped. It was over, and the thing was gone. I got up quickly and turned on all the lights. I kicked the side of my bed. I still thought the thing was under there, and I wanted to see it in the light. I was daring it to come out, and I was still praying. Finally, I pushed the bed aside, expecting something to be there, but there was nothing. That, to date for me, that's the only shadow person story I've ever heard where there was a physical altercation. It's one of the few uh, ones where, yeah, the person was physically grabbed, although I've heard many stories of people trying to be strangled by one. Yeah, that's true. Or making the motion where it feels like the breath is coming out of you. But I'll admit, you rarely hear one where somebody's grabbed by the ankles and dragged somewhere. Trying to be dragged under the bed. I mean, this is straight out of your worst nightmare. It's right up there with Poltergeist and that stupid clown in the first movie. Um, (laughs) When I say stupid, because it scared me. But also this had glowing red eyes. And then on top of that, I mean, this was a very religious man, which is interesting how that plays into it. And it plays into the idea for me that part of what's manifesting is manifesting as your own internal worst fear. And the fact that the Lord's prayer for him was a defense against it, that's interesting too. It does make you wonder why that works. And I've said this early on, maybe during the original Shadow People episode that we did, that you hear a lot of these anecdotes where people don't know what else to do. And of course, these are people more of a Western tradition, uh, Judeo-Christian faith, 
background. They may not be religious themselves, but they don't know what else to do. So they recite some prayers out of the Bible or uh, play religious music, play hymns. And it seems to either quell the situation for a while or make the entity matter, you know, make them more angry. Yeah. Okay. A lot of people aren't going to believe in this at all. Anyway, like this is all, you're just sleep deprived. Uh, you're mistaken. You were having a bad dream you couldn't wake up from, and you can't distinguish between waking state and a dream state. And that's all it was. And then there are people who have these experiences who tell you, no, I know what was going on. I know what happened to me. I was not asleep. My eyes were fully open. There was no difference. There may or may not have been paralysis, but they know what happened to them and they don't know what to make of it. But their beliefs come into it when you're that desperate and you try that and it seems to have some effect. I said this before. Well, if you believe that that incident was true and accurately described, well, that should be my catchphrase from now on, my, my mantra. Because, uh, you know, you'd have to wonder, is every detail being faithfully translated here or are some things off that might make a difference with what this was? But if it's being accurately retold, well, then you have to wonder if these beings, these entities, these uh, forces of the supernatural are real, why would they care about anything religious? Why would that upset them? That's the point I always go back to. Is that something within the person, though? Is that it's part of their belief and that's what's working to repel this thing? Is now they're fighting back in some way in a spiritual level uh, that's internal? Or is there something about the Christian faith that these beings hate? that makes them upset and maybe repels them a little. And that's what works. And then you wonder if somebody from another faith uses their faith specifically to repel something and if that works or not, or if that upsets the entity or not. What's going on here? But yeah, all I'll say is that you hear this quite a bit where somebody uses religion to repel these things and there is some effect. And the other thing that I like about this story or that I related to was he says, I, I can't remember if it's in the story we just told or it's in the book itself, but he didn't care who believed him. Right. That was nothing he was interested in. And as having had a personal experience myself, it's the same way I feel about the Sally House. I don't care if you believe me. I don't care if you believe what it was like. I mean, you can hear the recording. You can believe in that or not. But the experience of being there, I don't care if you get it. I don't care if you get what I went through. Just don't no, care. Everybody I like says to talk about it because it's a good makes for a good story on our show. <laughs> well, but just could care yeah. less if you're on board with me or not. <laughs> no, everybody seems to say that is that it's such a personal thing that other people's belief in it or not makes zero difference. I mean, right. sure, you would like to be believed by your friends and family, people whose opinion you care about and respect, but they're not going to ever get that unless they experience it themselves. And even a lot of people who do still deny it because they can't deal with it. They can't grapple with it. They can't wrap their heads around the feeling. And it's really hard to explain. It's what we always call the ineffable part of it, where it can't be described or relayed. It has to be experienced firsthand. Or even if you see somebody undergoing that and you can't explain that, that's part of it. And so, yes, people who experience this, they don't care what others believe because they know the impossible is possible. And once again, for people who don't believe any of this, these entities don't seem to care whether you believe in them or not. Right, so here's my self-care routine. Get in the shower, use whatever fancy stuff my wife has in there, and then act surprised when she's <laughs> like, how did that get empty so quick? Okay. Uh, I'm not positive I should be using a yeah. color-preserving conditioner, really, but as people have often joked on Reddit, men see the word shampoo, they wash. The word conditioner, they condition it. We're not great at making good choices there, but by the same token, there's not been a lot to choose from for us guys. But here's the thing. It turns out now there's a company that offers a perfect solution for finding customized premium grooming products for the discerning gentleman. And that company is Hawthorne. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not so sure about the gentleman part, but look, <laughs> I, I'm sure a lot of us will agree that with a lockdown, one self-care regimen can, let's just say, slip a little. So Scott and I are actually really digging all the products from Hawthorne. And Hawthorne is an innovative premium personal care brand that tailors their product recommendations for you as an individual, from hair to skin to hands. It's a fun and convenient way to get super high quality products formulated specifically for your needs, making it easy for guys to feel and smell your best. And, and when you look and smell your best, you feel your best. It's also important that we start to feel like well-groomed humans again. 
I know. I look and smell great. I just got to get past wearing sweats all day. Well, look, there's a lot <laughs> oh, of products dear. out there for men these days. But when it comes to premium level stuff, there's next to nothing geared towards us. What's really cool about Hawthorne is that you start off by taking a little quiz. They they ask you things you like. What's your favorite drink? What's your ideal night out? And of course, what's your skin type, uh, your daily hygiene, your routine and stuff like that? Yeah, it's kind of like a hybrid between a personality test and a self-care preference questionnaire. It only takes a few minutes to fill out, and I was actually impressed by the thoughtful questions. I'm guessing there's a scientific angle to it, like taking into account your lifestyle preferences and how they might affect your skin and hair. Then, based on your answers, Hawthorne recommends which products are best for your needs. So like when I opened the box, I honestly felt like everything in it was custom formulated just for me. Even the packaging says things like, your shampoo, your moisturizer. But two additional benefits to trying Hawthorne are, at first, you can rely on free shipping for your order as well as any returns. I mean, who doesn't like that? And second, speaking of returns, if you don't like your products, they'll retailer their recommendations based on your feedback. Yeah, I don't need any retailering because I pretty much tried everything I got all at once and I'm quite happy with it. The face cleanser they chose for me left me feeling clean without over drying and, and feeling tight. The moisturizers refreshed my face and hands, blended in completely, aren't perfumey, and the deodorant smells terrific. They're my new daily drivers. Do what we did. Take Hawthorne's quiz today and get started on your personalized self-care routine by going to hawthorne.co and using promo code LEGENDS to get 10% off your first purchase. Yeah, and that's .co or co for our UK listeners, not com. That's H-A-W-T-H-O-R-N-E dot co, C-O, promo code LEGENDS. One more time. Go to H-A-W-T-H-O-R-N-E dot C-O and use promo code LEGENDS. If you love fine wine, you're going to want to hear about Cameron Hughes Wine. Yeah, Cameron Hughes Wine has quite a unique business model, which is sourcing top-rated wines directly from the best wineries around the world, then offering them at a fraction of the price and delivering them right to your door. There's a secret in the wine selling business that most people don't know about. The elite wineries always overproduce when compared to what they publish as the official quantities. And what this does is keep the prices high for these wines. So armed with this insider knowledge, Cameron Hughes purchases these surplus quantities from the world's finest wine producers. He doesn't reveal where he gets them. That's the deal. Instead, he sells them under his own label. But you're really not going to believe this until you try it for yourself. I'll usually prefer a good red. So the first one I sampled was a bottle of Cameron Hughes Lot 717, which was just labeled as a 2015 vintage Super Tuscan from Italy. But the label didn't lie. It was pretty super. Full-bodied bouquet, smooth, savory finish, great with pasta. Really enjoyed that one. So then, because I got to represent my region, I tried one of their white blends, Lot 745 from the Walla Walla Valley, and was equally impressed. Scott and I were talking about a comment from the late Anthony Bourdain, and it was about how he got emails from people who were upset and angry he wasn't trying the latest, hippest microbrew at a favorite restaurant, when all he wanted to do is drink a good cold beer and not have to analyze it. And I couldn't agree more. I just like a good wine at a fair price to have a meal with or relax with, and I don't want to take notes about it. But the upshot with Cameron Hughes is that you can get high-quality wines from the best producers and regions in the world and get them with incredible savings. Luxury wines at affordable prices. Best price, best wine, quality guaranteed. Drink like a millionaire. Mm -hmm. Lot 735, for example, the delicious Santa Barbara Cabernet Sauvignon from a top winemaker that wins gold medals and top scores year after year is offered for $16 a bottle. That is less than half its original winery tasting room price. Well, here's the great news for our listeners. These wines are already an amazing value for top-rated award-winning wines from big-name wine at a fraction of the price. But today, Cameron is offering an additional 20% off on three or more bottles and free shipping. And all you have to do is enter code AL at checkout. Save money and drink the best wine. Go to chwine.com today to get 20% off the already wonderful prices and free shipping when you buy three or more bottles. Just remember to enter our code AL at checkout. That's chwine. Dot com and use offer code AL at checkout for 20% off three bottles or more, plus free shipping. Fantastic wine delivered right to your door in the safety of your own home. Hi, everyone. I'm Jordan Birch. 
And when I am not trying my very best to learn Hebrew and Greek at seminary, I'm listening to Astonishing Legends. Now let's get back to the show, shall we? All right, well, let's hear about Rebecca's story now. One of the descriptions that stood out to me in your book was the story of Rebecca, who had, I guess, had been messing around with the occult, and she found the hidden room in the house. Mm Mm-hmm. That was a fascinating story, but the one of the little details that, that and this is one of those things that kind of freaks me out, was it goes back to Skinwalker Ranch, had some of this stuff going too, but she was saying that the shadows that she saw had these really weird, jerky movements as opposed to a fluidity. I've never seen a shadow person, but like when something like that, when it looks glitchy in a way, that really bugs me. Um, well, that, <laughs> Scott, you remember that? That reminds me of the episode of uh, The X-Files. Yeah. Where somebody was seeing a black mass and it was uh, it was very jittery. Yeah, yeah. that's just, and because the, there was that Skinwalker story where the, the wolf that came out of the corn was one dimensional, like it turned and it was mm-hmm. like a piece of paper. Anyway, I just, that story really... That's when I'm like, okay, what is happening? I mean, beyond, like you said, where is this falling in your perception or the person who's experiencing it? Is it out in the world or is it something that's being impressed into their mind or into their optic nerve or how does it work? And then when it starts defying physics in a way in terms of its movement or or whatever, it's the, what is that saying about what's producing it, I guess? Yeah, and that is especially creepy. I, I remember, you know, interviewing her and hearing that and I just thought that's that really is kind of unsettling, you know, to think about those things moving in that way. But Rebecca's case actually is a good example of someone who very well may have been co-creating the experience because she was delving into the occult. And some people have great experiences delving into these traditions, and some people, you know, go at it very haphazardly, and they're trying to, you know, conjure something or make contact with something. And, you know, if they don't know what they're doing or they're, it's just a lot of room for error in a lot of those traditions. So, you know, I think Rebecca's case uh, may have been one where she was, oh, you know, maybe kind of making contact, but maybe helping create something into reality at the same time. When she was a teenager, Rebecca moved with her parents to an older home in eastern North Carolina. It was a fairly normal town, and the family had lived in the area for a while, so Rebecca didn't lose her connection to her friends or school. The house was a foreclosure her father purchased at a bargain price, and it needed a lot of work. But it was big, and it meant Rebecca and her siblings would all have their own rooms. In short order, Rebecca made a startling discovery in the home. I got to pick my bedroom and I took the one that was upstairs at the front of the house. It had a big walk-in closet that had obviously been part of the main room originally. The whole house was a bit odd, really. It was old and people had tried to upgrade it piecemeal. A lot of things just didn't fit right. In my room, someone had built a wall to create the closet and it had sort of a weird angle. It was only a couple of weeks after we had moved into the house that my best friend Rachel was over hanging out. I was still in the same school because we'd only moved across town. We were lying on the floor talking about people at school and I was kind of staring around the room. I said something to Rachel about the closet and that it was weird how it had been built. Rachel replied that yes, it was weird that she thought my room would be bigger because it was a pretty big house. It got me thinking about the fact that my room did seem small. I got up and leaned out the window of my room just looking at the house. I was thinking that yes, my room should be bigger. Rachel and I went in the closet, and I was pushing against the wall of it because it seemed flimsy. I was actually afraid it would fall down and into my room. I had put the bed on the other side of the room because of this. When I pushed against the wall, though, I heard another sound from the back corner of the closet. Pushing against the main wall made some boards on the other wall move. We went to the corner, and I could see that the boards were very loose, and it looked like light was coming through those boards. I pulled one away some, and I could tell there was another room behind it. Now I knew why my room was smaller. There was another space boarded up behind the closet wall. Rachel and I were both excited, and we pulled away at a couple more of the boards and removed enough of them so we could crawl through. We went into the little room. It was pretty dusty in there. There was a small window up high, but from the outside I had thought it was an attic window. There wasn't much in the room except an old wooden chair. 
Around the floor, there was a lot of wax. You could tell that someone had burned a lot of candles in there. Rachel was staring at the floor and said she thought something was drawn on the wood floorboards. We used our shoes to scrape away some of the dirt on the floor. What we found was a big pentagram drawn in the middle of the room. We figured someone who used to live there had been doing witchcraft in the room. David's passage on the story continues as follows. Well, like many teenage girls, Rebecca and her friend Rachel were fascinated by the idea of practicing magical arts. The girls were teenagers in the mid-90s when Wicca was experiencing a phase of popularity and countless books were being published on the topic. The idea of being witches had a certain allure of mystery and hinted at powers others didn't have. Rebecca did not report the hidden room to her parents. Instead, she and Rachel, along with a third friend, formed a coven and began practicing rituals they found in books on witchcraft. Rebecca took the discovery of the hidden room as a sign they should be practicing Wicca. Their practice became a mishmash of various belief systems, mostly in an attempt to gain psychic powers and the ability to influence other people to do their will. They also attempted to tell each other's fortunes with tarot cards and other fortune-telling tools. On some level, Rebecca claims, they were just having fun, while on another level, they were genuinely hoping to gain some kind of insight. Their rituals became more elaborate. They played with a Ouija board, recited spells they had found in books, and even tried making a voodoo doll when a high school boy angered the three of them with what they considered an affront to their coven. It was no doubt the formula for countless B-grade horror movies, but it was the reality of the belief system the girls were developing. Rebecca says, I think at some point we really started to identify ourselves as witches. It became all we talked about and all we wanted to do. Our parents ignored it. They just figured we were going through some teenage phase. We spent a lot of time in an old bookstore we'd found because it had a lot of books on the occult. It got to where we would just find things and follow the directions in the books. We were convinced that some of the magic, at least, was working. Our friend's family suddenly had to move because of work, so our coven went down to two, just myself and Rachel. The thing is that once there were only two of us, things seemed to change. We didn't believe we were as powerful anymore, and we didn't feel like the magic worked the same. The weird thing was, we always felt like someone else was in that little room with us. I started seeing a shadow form moving around the room. I thought maybe it was just due to the flickering of the candle flames because the shadows had that weird, jerky movement. But the shadows seemed to have a mind of their own. I could move the candles and the shadows wouldn't budge. One night we did a ritual for one of the high Sabbaths. Rachel had to go home because she was leaving on a family trip early the next day. That night, the shadow forms were in my bedroom. I saw them come out of the closet and I knew they had come out from the hidden room. This started happening every night over the next several weeks. I would fall asleep, but wake up suddenly and they would be standing around my bed, staring at me. I tried everything I knew to banish them. I did protection techniques that I had learned in books, but nothing worked. I couldn't find anything in my witchcraft books that would help. Rebecca describes these shadow beings as small, around four feet in height. At any given time, there were three to five of them, but she always had the sense there were more, hiding in the darkness or in the closet. Most disturbing, she said, was that the dark beings had glowing red eyes. She claimed she was fully awake during the encounters, and as the experiences progressed, she had more difficulty sleeping even a portion of the night. At first, she started going down to the living room and sleeping on the couch. When questioned by her parents, she made the excuse that she had fallen asleep studying. This worked for a few days, but then she started seeing the shadow people in the living room, too. Rebecca came to believe it was her dabbling in the occult that allowed the beings to come through from the other side. She became convinced they were spirits of the deceased that wanted to make contact. Her attempts at reasoning with them or establishing a rapport were unsuccessful. Perhaps surprisingly, Rebecca did not abandon her practice of witchcraft, and after she graduated high school, she moved in with a boyfriend who also practiced the craft. They both report that shadow beings are frequently in their home. They now believe the beings are interdimensional and they're not human at all. They also believe that as long as the shadow people do not receive energy, they will not be capable of manifesting fully or causing harm to those in the physical world. Rebecca's unique viewpoint and attitude towards the shadow people certainly places her in the minority, 
At this point, she even believes they are occasionally helpful. Is she serving her own ego or trying to avoid the responsibility of setting something loose in this world? Perhaps. Either way, she does not believe her role is to send them away, but to merely keep them in check, a type of magical damage control. She goes on to say, Yes, I believe I did something foolish and let this group of shadows in, but I also believe that I can help keep them from fully coming into this world. It was my mistake, so now it's my responsibility to take care of the situation. We do things to keep them at bay, and at least they're not off disturbing someone else. If anything happens to me, then other people in my coven will take over the work of holding these beings in their place. Well, that story reminded me of two things. One, the pentagram that was on the floor at the Sally house in the basement. Yeah. Which we saw, we which did. was smudged out, but you could tell something was there. And of course, uh, the people who know the story say, yeah, it was definitely there. And the person living there at the time was trying to use witchcraft to bring forth something, possibly to do their bidding. And the tone of it, people could say like, well, they were doing good things. I take it as what was the person like? And from all the reports we heard, of course, we said this in the series, this was not a nice person. It wasn't a friendly person. I kind of have to go with uh, these weren't good things that this person was trying to do with these practices. And the other observation I had about that is that witchcraft has become very popular nowadays because people are looking for a way to have some control over this crazy world, especially nowadays, where you feel like you are lost and you have no control over things. So it's possibly a way of gaining some power back for yourself. But I do believe that route, unless you really know what you're doing, can lead to some negative effects for yourself and others around you. But I do believe that often there are consequences to these practices that are unintended and unwanted, and you have to be careful. And the second thing it reminds me of is one of the last stories we did in our Ouija Stories episode. Remember, uh, coming from uh, the Warwick, Indiana Paranormal Society and their investigation of the woman using the Ouija board to keep spirits around. Yes. And I've heard now from several paranormal investigators how they have a case where they try to help this person. One was a, a case of a succubus where the guy didn't really want it to leave because he was lonely. The Warwick case, the woman got lonely and wanted the spirits around. And there may be some similarities with this where the person actually starts to enjoy all the interactions because it's something you can turn to and, and it's there, it's scary, but it's the devil you know. Well, one of the last things that I guess Rebecca said about this particular case was they now believe the beings are interdimensional and they are not human at all. They also believe that as long as the shadow people do not receive energy, they will not be capable of manifesting fully or causing harm to those in the physical world. That's from page 30 of uh, David's book. You know what? It's just hard enough keeping a cat from scratching your furniture. I, having something else you're trying to keep at bay from manifesting, maybe just one more daily worry that I wouldn't want to take on. Well, it's time to talk about Puckwudgies. This is another being or entity that you've heard about on our show before, if you've been listening to us for a while. This is from pages 35 and 36 of uh, David's book, Strange Intruders. A Puckwudgie is a small troll-like creature usually associated with the folklore of the Wampanoag Indians of Massachusetts. The creatures are between two and three feet tall. They resemble humans somewhat, but their features are exaggerated. They have thick hair on their bodies, large ears, oversized mouths, and oversized noses that sometimes look canine. Their fingers are long, and their skin is usually described as being smooth and bluish gray, or ashen in color. Some accounts mention different colors or even that they emit light, causing them to glow in the dark, but this may relate to some of their purported magical abilities. Their clothing, such as it is, is made of material taken from nature, such as bark, limbs, and leaves. This gives them a form of camouflage, allowing them to blend in easily with the forest. So, yeah, and these things, by the way, they have a lot of power. They can appear and disappear mm -hmm. at will. They can create fire with magic. They carry sticks with poison arrows and short knives. They'll throw sand at you to blind you. They have yeah. some kind of poison dust. They can shapeshift. Seems like everything can. And uh, <laughs> they can be friendly to people, but they became tricksters. And the other yeah. thing that David's book talks about is interesting is that they, they might be able to control the souls of people that they have killed, which would explain mm. why they do the things that they've done. And once again, iron, salt, and the Lord's Prayer will somehow get you out of trouble with these guys. 
Right, right. Well, I would keep the uh, the kosher salt because it's been blessed by a rabbi. And I, of course, I learned that from uh, Fox Mulder on the uh, millennial episode of The X-Files, keeping the four horsemen of the apocalypse zombies at bay. But yeah, these similar things of, of metal, salt, prayer. And I do wonder if these creatures who sound a lot like their European cousins of other uh, fey creatures and trolls and elves and hobgoblins. There seem to be quite a few similarities there, but a North American flavor or a species, if you will, of a similar woodland type of uh, strange creature. Well, enough of my nonsense, which probably would anger any Pukwudgie. Let's go hear what David has to say about this. So I wanted to move on to your next chapter and we probably will share some stories from this, but it was the one about puck wedgies. We actually have a friend who is a um, controlled remote viewing instructor who we've taken some classes from, and she has a story about a puck wedgie trying to tempt her off into the woods and being sort of in a trance before she realized what was happening, but she managed to get her act together and not follow it. And that's the only person that I know that's had that kind of account- encounter and they have a very complex mythology, it seems, based on how you explained where they come from and the traditions that they evolved out of. You know, aside from the people that you talk to in your book, is this something in your research because you've been doing this so long? Do you, what's the frequency with which you encounter Pukwudgy stories? With Pukwudgy specifically, not so often. Mm-hmm. In fact, you'll find one in the Indiana book, which is uh, somewhat unusual because they're really distinctly attached to the area that I talk about in, in Strange Intruders in southeastern Massachusetts because they're they're connected to tribal traditions there. Mm-hmm. However, I do get a lot of reports of various little people okay. from around the country and around the world. And it's something that uh, has long fascinated me. And I and I always put this out, you know, when, when this comes up and I'm doing shows, you know, if anybody has a modern encounter uh, with any kind of you know, gnome or little person or something like that, you know, please do send it to me, uh, which you can do directly on the on my website. And you know, I, I love to hear these accounts because, again, it's something that a lot of people don't realize is going on still in the modern world, so to speak. But there are a lot of modern accounts, even in the United States, of encounters with various types of little people. Well, in terms of the Pukwudgie stories in your book, I think the one that stood out the most to me was the one about the the Grover, the, the little Grover from Sesame Street. <laughs> the, oh, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Basically looked like Grover in the woods. And that's interesting that just like the vivid red color, here we come back with colors, which we just talked about a few minutes ago. But also the other thing that seems to come up a lot, and it comes up later when you talk about the Slender Man and everything, is the impossibly thin limbs, right? And the, the way that these things right. are built. Where does that come from, you think? Because, I, you know, I'm trying to decide what these look like, you know, and just speaking of your book on Indiana, and I looked at this illustration that you have in here on page 231, I think it is, or 230. Look at this for us. Yeah, I don't want to see that thing. In the words. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, but I, I what, what is, <laughs> the, because in my mind, I'm also seeing, uh, I can't remember that crazy looking. Scott, are you thinking of, you're not thinking of the spider entity or the, Sparky, which was from our Sludge Entity episodes, which was described, and often some of these entities are described as having tendrils, long, impossibly thin arms, maybe no hands, but just they have appendages. There are recurring themes with the visual sightings of these creatures. In general, Pukwudgie is described as a a small, kind of a troll-like creature is is what a common description is. Uh, They're said to have oversized ears and, you know, their, their features are supposed to be oversized. Their noses are large. Their, you know, their eyes and, and mouths are, are large, but they're humanoid. Uh, it's just that they're much shorter and they, they do have uh, long fingers and uh, skin that's usually described as being kind of an ashen or, or bluish gray uh, color. So it's kind of curious because, you know, in those terms, we somewhat get into territory that's similar to the alien grays. And, you know, at the same time, this is a, a very old tradition. It, it comes from the Wapanawag tribe of Massachusetts. And one of the things that's fascinating about the Pukwudgies is that while a lot of Native traditions talk about little people in the United States, 
Uh, the mythology of the Pukwudgies is very unique in that they're the race that uh, wins. You know, most of the time when you hear these stories from different places around the world, even of a conflict with another race of beings, whether they're little people or something else, the little people usually lose, you know, if there's a fight and they kind of go away. You know, again, you know, whether that's going through a portal or another level of resistance or whatever it is, either way, they kind of disappear. But in the traditions of the Pukwaji, they end up battling the sort of hero figure of uh, tribal lore, which is uh, called uh, Mashop. And uh, he's a giant uh, who comes to the aid of the people because the Pukwajis have uh, essentially ended up in a war with uh, humans. And the hero figure comes in, and at first, you know, he's, he's picking these little people up and he's throwing them to the the far corners of the earth, you know, he's just tossing them away everywhere. But they end up returning, and in the end of the conflict, uh, they shoot him full of arrows, uh, which causes him to kind of stagger around, and eventually he falls down and uh, disappears, you know. So the Pukwudgies won. <laughs> and, um, you know, the legends say that because of that, they still uh, live in those areas of southeastern Massachusetts. You know, people, there are modern sightings of these things. They'll describe seeing these little people, usually dressed in natural materials, you know, like bark and moss and things like that. So we're very much talking about a sort of an earth elemental type of being that shows up in the forest. And by modern accounts, they can, again, be tricksters, uh, but at the same time, they can help people. You know, it just... Uh, sort of depends on their mood if you start looking at the accounts. Okay, folks, these Pukwudgie stories are a little bit on the shorter side, so we took three of them and put them together. You're going to hear them all in a row right here. So the first story, that's one of the shortest ones. That actually takes place all the way back in 1927 in Indiana, and it's one of the more famous Pukwudgie stories. So we're going to play that one first, and then we're going to transition into the second story, which has to do with a sighting at a lake or, or a pond called Asawampset Lake. And uh, this is actually not too far from the Bridgewater Triangle. So uh, you may have heard us mention that on the show before. You can look that up if you want more information on it. The last story takes place at a cemetery called the Vale End Cemetery in Wilton, New Hampshire. And <laughs> this one is pretty bizarre, but also scary. It actually refers to Grover. Yes, Grover from Sesame Street. And I just want to go ahead and say, yes, we know Grover is blue. Mm-hmm. In the story, they refer to this thing they saw as looking like Grover and being red. We all know that Elmo <laughs> is red and Grover is blue. We think it refers to Grover's body type. Please yes. stop typing the email. <laughs> <laughs> but it's an important thing that Scott mentioned to me the other day when we were having this discussion. It's like, well, what are the differences between Elmo and Grover? And you, yes, you were absolutely right. Grover has more of these skinny flailing arms and yes. uh, the rounder head, perhaps. But, of course, he's blue and he's much older. Yes, indeed. Wait, are they related? I don't know. Okay. In June 1927, while hiking along Indiana's White River, 10-year-old Paul Startsman found an abandoned gravel pit and there met a two-foot-tall man wearing a light blue robe. Quote, We stood about 10 yards apart and looked at each other. He had thick, dark blonde hair, and his face was round and pinkish in color, like it was sunburned. After a moment, the tiny, barefoot figure turned and fled into the woods. Startsman claimed he later had another meeting with the little man in the same area. He had a friend with him during the second encounter, and he reported the small man followed behind them for some time before vanishing among the trees. Startsman also talked to reporters about his encounter and it was noted that the boy's mother was full-blooded Native American, perhaps indicating a connection to the little people through heritage. We were out at Asawamset Lake. It was late spring and the weather was nice. We got there kind of late in the day and we were waiting for the sun to go down. For years, we had heard stories of strange lights that would appear and move around. We wanted to get a glimpse of them, My girlfriend was with me, and so was her cousin, a guy named Chad. Chad claimed that he had seen the lights before when he was young. I wasn't sure if I believed they were real or not. Once the sun started going down, we got anxious, wondering if we would see something when it was finally dark. 
There was still plenty of light out. We probably had another half an hour or more before it would get dark enough for lights to show up. I was getting nervous, though. I kept feeling like something was watching us. I sat down. Then I got back up and paced around. My girlfriend was getting irritated with me, but I couldn't shake the feeling. I couldn't get comfortable. Maybe another ten minutes had passed. I was walking around. We were in a little clear area. I thought I saw something move out of the corner of my eye. That made me really nervous. Then I saw it again. This time, I really saw it. It was some kind of little man. He was about three feet tall. I only really saw him from the waist up because he was looking out from around a tree. It really freaked me out. The little man had wild hair that went in every direction. He had a big nose, large ears, and a big mouth. He looked like he was really pissed off, maybe because I had seen him. I couldn't help myself. I let out a scream. I know it wasn't very manly, but it just happened. It seemed to anger the little man even more because he really scowled at me then. I turned and I ran. I passed my girlfriend and her cousin yelling that I was out of there, and I kept going until I reached my car. I didn't know if they were following me or not, but either way, I was leaving. I got in the car and started the engine. They were both jumping in the car as I put it into gear to leave. It turned out that seeing me so freaked out, it scared them too. Later, I told them what had happened. Chad said that I had seen a puckwudgie and that I would have a whole bunch of bad luck. Maybe it's true. It wasn't long after that that I split with my girlfriend and then I had to move because my apartment building got sold. I'm not going back to that pond, and I have no desire to ever see one of those evil little men again. Paranormal investigator Fiona Broom and three others were at Vale End Cemetery in Wilton, New Hampshire, conducting an investigation in the late 90s. On this particular occasion, the only notable activity was a high level of EMF, or electromagnetic field readings near the Blue Lady's grave. Just as darkness began to fall, the group decided to end their investigation. Broom headed for the Blue Lady's headstone for one last round of photos. That's when she spotted what she referred to as a little Grover guy. Recounting the incident on her website, Hollow Hill, she says, I've spotted what I've since called a little Grover guy, about two or three feet from me. He was short, between two and three feet tall. He looked like he was covered with fur and disproportionately skinny like Grover, the popular puppet character from Sesame Street. Broom notes the figure was a vivid shade of red. The ghost hunter was surprised, but not bothered by the creature. She continued walking towards her destination. Right after the sighting, however, Broom encountered an invisible force she believed was something profoundly evil. And beyond this, she suddenly realized there were dozens of small fur-covered creatures in the cemetery. Determined to capture evidence of the creatures, Broom raised her camera and started snapping pictures. Her camera seemed to reveal more of the creatures. As I raised my camera and looked through the viewfinder, the Red Grover guy seemed to multiply. When my camera clicked, I saw three of them clearly outlined by the flash. Satisfied she had caught the beings on film, she suddenly had the strong impression she was in danger. She moved quickly to her car and left the area along with the other ghost hunters. Later, when the film was developed, Broom discovered all of the shots she had taken were completely black, with the exception of a single shot. In it, there was a red shape, the same vivid colors the creatures she had seen. Demonologist John Zaffis later correlated the strange image captured by the camera to a sign of demonic manifestation. Despite having hundreds of ghost hunts under her belt, Fiona was genuinely frightened by her encounter in Vale End and says, in fact, it was the only time she's ever been frightened on an investigation. Never one to believe in demonic forces prior to the experience, Broom now considers the possibility of such evil entities. So if you haven't figured out by now, that's what, uh, when John Boland built that beautiful, wonderful opening to the show for us that he likes to do in October shows, <laughs> yeah. uh, that was a puck wedgie situation there up at the top. Oh boy. 
<laughs> Let me ask you this, Scott. Yeah. Having now, well, grown up with, you know, Sesame Street and the Muppets like I did, and, and now having a son who I would hope you've introduced to all the Muppet characters. Oh, yes. Could you imagine a moment, a scenario where an Elmo-like figure was more frightening than this? Oof, it's just... No. That's, it definitely beats the monster at the end of this book, uh, <laughs> which is Grover. <laughs> Which we read many, many hundreds of times. No, and and as I was reading the story, I thought this was going to be more heartwarming and and kind of funny. And sometimes those do happen. Yeah. Uh, Sometimes there's weird scenarios where there's a lot of humor with it. And the person feels like, okay, that was really weird. But I think maybe these things were trying to help me. This has more of a Gremlins the movie kind of vibe or the Kelly Hopkinsville Goblins where it's like, oh, look, that's cute. Oh, my God, it's attacking us. (laughs) Well, (laughs) well, case in point, that one, yeah, they were afraid and they thought these things were dangerous, but they really didn't attack them all that much. I mean, I think they pulled on uh, uh, one of the gentleman's hair. Yes. But very clumsy and awkward in their welcome wagon, get to know you in the neighborhood presence. But here, you got something that seems kind of funny looking. Like, I just, I I can't imagine seeing that in real life. And then they start to multiply. And then you get this feeling like, oh, these things, uh, they're not good. You know what else it reminds me of is is the miners in Galaxy Quest. Oh, yeah. (laughs) That's right. Yeah, Yeah. they can't be more than six or seven years old. (laughs) Miners, not miners, you idiot. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> uh, yes and in another show reference uh, this one reminded me though of the uh, the dark turn a character takes is in uh, the simpsons where uh, uh elmo is chasing people down the street elmo knows where you live <laughs> but yeah no this is a case where something that seems kind of funny is really not what it seems yeah at first blush Well, folks, we hope you've enjoyed the show up until now. We're ramping into the ending and our last segment with David before we share that final story from his book for tonight uh, in part one of this two-part series with him. We have some really solid questions for him getting into some of personal experiences that he had. One in particular is very, very freaky. It's a really good story. Then after we do that, you're going to hear one of the scariest stories from his book, which will take us to the end of the show. And uh, this one's going to leave you scratching your head. We know it did ours. Speaking of motivations for these creatures, one of the things I I really enjoyed about your book are the through lines and the overarching themes that run through them. Because I've always said to to Scott and all on the show that uh, how we learn about these things is finding commonalities and making patterns and connections, maybe to gain a little insight and understanding. You know, so if you start looking at these creatures, some interact with you, some kind of mess you up throw tricks your way. A lot of them, like some shadow people and like these, uh, the color people are just there to observe. And when you look at Puck Wajis and some of the little people, and I, I've also heard accounts um, from friends of friends, not generally seeing something, but noticing that uh, they got a real sense that there were something like leprechauns or fairies or something in the bushes or bushes were lit up and they had the strong sense to go follow it. And then something snaps them out of it at the last moment and says, no, you don't want to go with them because you're not going to come back. So with some of these creatures, like the little creatures, it seems they want you to come with them. And, you know, in the cases of folklore, that harkens to the stolen child or stolen children, changelings. And uh, in, in Celtic lore, you have a lot of this. So is that something that you've noticed is a, a common theme with some of the smaller beings, is that they want you to go off with them? And where do you think that they go And what do you think that they want with you there? First of all, it's really cool that you got that thread that kind of goes through the book because, uh, you know, I I honestly don't know how many other people have have sort of perceived that, but that was intentional when I wrote the book. So it's it's great to hear somebody express that they were sort of following that, you know, as they as they read through the book, you know, and and the the topics were chosen specifically to show sort of the long history and the varied history of these interactions that humans have with these various entities, you know, in terms of the little people and and them luring humans away. Yeah, that is absolutely a a very common part of the mythos, especially you go to Europe and and delve into tales of the the wee folk and, you know, whether it's the gnomes or the elves or, you know, whatever region of the continent you're in, you know, you hear different versions of that. And it's, kind of fascinating to look at that too in modern terms of oh gosh we could even make the big leap and say all right well you know 
uh, aliens abduct people and take them somewhere else. So, you know, what is it with these entities that want to take people away somewhere? Uh, when we're looking at the little people specifically, man, we can go deep on that in a couple different directions because I think that on some occasions, what we're seeing is a, a visitation from something that is living in one of those other dimensions that is coming through. And of course, there are stories of people, you know, going with the little ones and, um, you know, they think they've been gone for two hours and they come back and it's you know, 20 years or something. And, you know, a lot of those stories, of course, are from the mythology and the different folk tales. But we really have to wonder when we look at those tales and then we look at modern accounts of people experiencing missing time from various types of phenomena that they've uh, gone through. So I think that this is one of the most intriguing aspects of this lore, and it's something that really connects to the overall picture in a much deeper way that we don't yet understand. I think it does, you know, maybe quantum science will finally explain it to us somehow. But, you know, if we're looking at something that is crossing dimensions, then, yeah, absolutely, we're looking at a distortion of time. As to why they want to do this, you know, that's a really tough question. And in some ways, I think we have to go back to individual motivation, again, both on the part of the entity and on the part of the experiencer, because in a lot of these cases, I, I think the experience is mutual. Some of the stories, people are, are compelled or almost hypnotized, and they don't have a choice. But on other occasions, you know, you hear these stories and the people are like, you know, I, I wanted to go with them. It was, you know, I wanted to experience this. And when we start looking at those accounts, then we're almost looking at something that is kind of a, a shamanic initiation to a, a degree because, you know, we're talking about someone who is having an experience that takes them to an altered sense of reality. And people who have these experiences, uh, they come back different. That's all there is to it. Uh, you know, whether it's, uh, whether it's an account, you know, of, of seeing one of these things in the forest and losing a little bit of time or whether it's, uh, you know, something like an, an alien abduction, you know, a lot, we know for a fact that a lot of these people, they are never the same after they come back. And sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes it's a bad thing. That's a poignant thought. I mean, you know, you think about uh, Travis Walton or these other folks that have been through this kind of stuff and being on the back end of it or on the back end of a lot of personal experiences, really. I mean, and that's something I actually, since you brought this up, I mean, have you had life-changing personal experiences in the course of your travels and research that you feel like changed you? Absolutely. On, on numerous occasions. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's kind of par for the course if you go really deep on a lot of these topics. It's just, um, you know, it's like I said earlier, you peer long enough into the void, things are going to look back. And you kind of have to choose, you know, do you, do you continue diving deep or do you back off? And, yeah. and, you know, kind of throw your hands up and give up. Uh, that's always individual choice. But, yeah, I mean, I think you get to the point, too, where even just delving into this stuff the way you guys do, even, you know, going deep on some of these topics, it's going to affect your consciousness. That's all there is yeah. to it because it forces you to, well, it forces you to either shut down like a skeptic would and say, no, this is all, I don't believe any of this is all BS. Or, you know, you start questioning very basic things that you probably grew up, uh, <laughs> you know, pretty confident about. Yeah. I've, I've only had one significant personal experience, which all our listeners know about because we <laughs> talked about it on the show. But And I willed it to happen psychically. Uh, <laughs> well, the, yeah, it definitely changed me. I'm still cha significantly changed from, I mean, we've only been doing the show six years, but I'm a completely different person from when we started it. And we, what was the most significant that you're willing to share personal experience that caused the biggest change in your, I guess, outlook? Oh, um... I don't know if I can answer that right off. Uh, you know, the, I certainly can't say which one is the most significant because you ask me tomorrow, it's probably going to be a different one. Uh, right. These things have come up pretty frequently. And, um, oh, gosh, let me think about it a few minutes and we'll, we'll come back around to it. Yeah, in relation to what you were just saying, in the really terrifically written foreword by Micah Hanks, I think he would describe himself and yourself as well, you, you two being longtime friends, as... Keelsian researchers owing to the pathfinding that was done by John Keel. We've mentioned on the show a lot. That's something that Scott and I very much appreciate and, and uh, piqued our curiosity with your body of work and, uh, and your, your profile. 
but something that John Keel had seemed to allude to is that, and to back up a little here, you know, the control remote viewing instructor, Lori, who uh, has become a friend of ours. One thing I asked her when we took our beginning course was, will more things start to happen to me? Will I see more things once you start practicing remote viewing and trying to raise your consciousness and exploring some of these other traditions? And she said, yes, (laughs) definitely yes. In that once you have more of a situational awareness, you'll notice more things, but things start to come to you. And and she thinks that maybe that's why she's had some of the experiences she's had. But as you were just alluding to, when you start to study these things, do you think that you have maybe been guided in some way to more knowledge or a higher consciousness? And then owing to something like what John Keel may have alluded to is that he's also being misled or that information coming through isn't exactly useful or uh, there's a, a strange awkwardness to the information coming in and the guidance that seems to be uh, coming through to him and that, yes, he's being helped, but not really very well. Uh, would you say that that's been kind of happening to you or do you think you're being guided in some way or and then maybe misled in some others? Yes. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Asked and answered. This is kind of a great segue because I can tell, I can share a story with you guys that uh, kind of addresses what you're talking about, but also what Scott was asking me about things that are, are kind of transformative. And um, this is one that's only a few years old. You know, I always say that when you're delving into this stuff, uh, you know, never assume that you have the answers because, <laughs> you know, you might have the answer for the moment or you might think you have the answer, but um, it's very possible that something is going to quickly come along that uh, throws a wrench into that concept or, you know, redirects you. But, you know, typically for me, the more I delve into this stuff, the more questions I have. Uh, it's why it kind of cracks me up when I see people who have gotten into the field, you know, and, and been in a couple of years and, you know, they're an authority on all of it. You know, they can, t- they can give you all the answers because they figured it all out. And, you know, those are the people that really need to you know, take up, you know, crochet or something, I think. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, so when I was working on Strange Intruders, I had sent a copy of uh, Black Eyed Children to a friend of mine who lived um, in Kentucky. And the thing is, what happened was he had a copy of the Black Eyed Children book, and I knew he'd received it. You know, he sent me a message or something. And it was probably a week or so after that that, uh, you know, I got a call from him on my cell phone. And, you know, I happened to not be in the the office or something. You know, I came back and saw Miss Log, and there was a message on there. And I listened to the message, and it's just, you know, dead air or whatever. You know, this happens a couple of different times, and I'm, I'm thinking, all right, you know, he's pocket dialing or something. And, you know, I shot him a message and, hey, what do you need, man? He's like, I, I wasn't trying to call you. I was like, oh, okay. And he's, he says, oh, I must have pocket dialed or something. And the thing is that this kept happening. I kept getting calls from his cell phone. And <laughs> the calls would come in, you know, I would get up and, and walk out of the office and I would come back and the, there'd be a missed log. So it was a little odd, you know, and the calls became very frequent. And at one point, you know, the call comes in and I was sitting there, but I didn't answer. You know, I thought, oh, you know, what now? And a message gets left on the cell phone. So I pick up, I listen to the message and it's long. It's, you know, the message just kind of goes on and on, but it's background noise. And I hear a kid laughing. Now, I did not jump to the conclusion, oh, oh my God, it's the black eyed children. I didn't even think about that, honestly. You know, I right. thought, oh, you know, are you serious? So I shot him a message and I was like, look, man, <laughs> you know, you're, because I knew he had a young child. I said, look, you know, your kids are getting a hold of your phone and dialing <laughs> my number, you know, or something. Well, I, I get back this whole apology from him, you know, oh man, I'm really sorry. Yeah, you know, that's, that's probably the case. But it keeps happening. And it becomes very strange because sometimes I'll get kind of on a, a bent writing, you know, and I, I would just write the entire night, you know, stay up all night. So I, I would get Ms. Logs at three or four in the morning, you know, and things like this. And one day I, I'm sitting there in my office and this message pops up online from him. And he's like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. You know, I've got to, you know, I've got to tell you about this because my phone had just rung from him. And then a message pops up and I'm thinking, oh, he really was calling me this time. So I talked to him and he says, you're, you're not going to believe this, man. I, 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 <laughs> I was sitting in bed and my cell phone was sitting in the middle of the bed beside me. 
I had just picked up your book. I was reading Black Eyed Children. And out of my peripheral vision, I saw the phone light up. It was dialing your number. Nobody was touching it. <laughs> really? <laughs> so I thought, okay, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. this is a bit more interesting. And, and he was kind of freaked out about it. And he's like, I'm taking this thing to the cell phone company. You know, I'm going to find out what's going on. Because he starts, he's looking at his phone logs, and there's constant calls to my number. You know, at, at times when he had the phone, you know, plugged in charging or, you know, he's no, nobody's around the phone or whatever. So, and it's only my number that it calls. So he takes it to his provider, you know, the texts look the phone over, you know, they try to figure it, they bring it back. They say, you're nothing wrong with your phone. And uh, we don't know why it's doing this. So it kind of goes on a little bit, uh, a little bit beyond that. And then, you know, he had sent me a message. He said, yeah, well, you know, we're going, we're going on the road. We're doing, we're going to investigate a bunch of different sites. And uh, well, that's cool, you know. And um, so he's with some friends. He's got his cell phone sitting up on the, the dash. And they're driving. The phone lights up and dials my number. For the final time, at the moment, they drove over the bridge into Point Pleasant, West Virginia. <laughs> wow. Of course. He tells me this, you know, and I sat there and I, I was, you know, sitting by myself in my office and I get this information and I just had this sense and sort of heard this confirmation of a voice saying, see, we can do what we want to. It kind of gave me this, uh, <laughs> this impression that, you know, this was the consciousness, you know, the phenomena, you know, whatever's behind a lot of this stuff directing this at me and saying see what we can do a lot of people that wouldn't be relevant to a lot of people a lot of people would brush it off and say well you know okay well there's no explanation from the technicians you know there's no explanation of why the phenomena ends but then you know for me personally the significance of because i knew john keel and uh, he's a big influence on, on my writing and um, the significance of it doing that the moment they drove into point pleasant was just kind of startling and, and somewhat creepy all at the same time. I find meaning in context. I, I say this quite often on the show is that uh, if you don't find any context with it, then you take what meaning you can from it and maybe it doesn't mean anything right away. But within the circumstantial context, it has a lot of meaning. And maybe that's the message. The message was we're watching, we can do whatever we want. What is your response to that? If you were in direct communication with them, what would you ask or what would your response be to that? If I was in direct communication with whatever if, this consciousness is? Uh, yeah. I mean, much again, much like the in the foreword to the book, uh, like like Keel himself said, he, he was able to submit a questionnaire uh, to an injury <laughs> yeah. cold like being. And Mr. Apple, yeah, A-P-O-L, yeah. where uh, there's some it, very interesting concepts going there, but you're able to communicate a little bit and it's awkward and it doesn't come through completely correct. But if you had that chance, what would you like them to know? Or what would you want to ask them? Well, I think the burning questions that, you know, a lot of us that delve into this uh, have, you know, where, where do you come from? You know, where, where are you and how did you get here? You know, or, or how do we get there? But that sort of goes back to what I was talking about earlier. And, and I'm not saying I definitely have you know, that any, anybody definitely has the answer to this, but I, I think quantum science is starting to point to a lot of potentials for where these things actually exist and where they come from. So, you know, I, I really do believe that it's some type of interaction that's going on with other dimensional beings. And I think that's what ancient cultures have talked about for a very long time. You know, when you hear these traditional accounts about other races that were here, and left however they left, whether it was a hole in the sky or, you know, a shimmering door or whatnot. So, yeah, I, I would just have those basic questions, you know, what, what exactly are you and, you know, where did you come from and why are you here? You know, what is it you want? Why are you interacting with us? Because I, I think that's one of the primary questions that a lot of people have. You know, if these things are happening, arguably to a growing number of humans. So exactly why is it happening? What's the end game? Well, if an email comes in <laughs> or a phone call comes to you after this recording session, please share the contents with us because <laughs> those are all the right questions. Well, let me ask you this. Since you brought it up now, it's something I wanted to ask you while we had you anyway. What was John Keel like? What was your relationship with him like? Do you have any um, 
you know, stories on you? How, you know, how much time did you get to spend with him when, when he was still alive? I was scattered, you know, because I mean, he lived, uh, you know, I lived in the South at the time and I, I was young. So, um, you know, it was before I got to travel a whole lot, but he was, he was kind of like you would expect. I mean, he was somewhat of a trickster, you know, he could be somewhat cantankerous sometimes, uh, you know, he had, by that point in his life, he had very defined ideas, you know, about things, but he was also, you know, I always found him very courteous and, you know, I, I always had questions for him, you know, and if I, you know, if I asked him questions, he would more often than not, he, he would, he would kind of answer, but very often he would sort of point me in directions, you know, that, I needed to pursue, I think. So in that sense, I believe that he, you know, was uh, probably ultimately more of an influence than he arguably should have been because, you know, I only had so much time with him, but his books, of course, were amazing. You know, I read those many years ago and, you know, I've read them repeatedly uh, through the decades. And, um, you know, of course, his approach was always uh, somewhat journalistic, which I I think... um, is a part of my personal approach. So, yeah, he's an interesting character. I mean, some people remember him fondly, and some people think he was uh, a very difficult person, and I, I'm sure that both are true. I'm envious. <laughs> it, I, it must have been so fascinating to actually have crossed paths with him. It's very, it's very cool. How did you decide to order the chapters of your book? It seems that you went from ancient to the most modern thing happening. That's more or less how it's played out to sort of, you know, follow that thread, of course, starting with the gin, mm-hmm. uh, which go, you know, far back in, in history. And then, you know, flowing through the other topics and have a, a deep history all the way up to, of course, the end with uh, Slender Man. But I did hit some of the if hot button topics, I think is what you called it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, when we, we start looking at the reptilians, because it certainly is controversial at the very least. And, you know, all of this stuff I I try to present in a very balanced way and say, look, this is what the tradition is. Uh, Here are some reports and (laughs) how that we explain this essentially, because I really, you know, I I hope that my writing, you know, stimulates some people to come up with, uh, you know, concepts and ideas of their own. and, And of course, research on their own to see what they can discover and hopefully, add to the overall picture. The the reptilian thing is something that it does. It immediately turns a lot of people off because they connect it with David Icke and his conspiracy theories. And <laughs> he, he delves into the whole, you know, he writes these opus you know, <laughs> books that are, <laughs> you know, five mm-hmm. to 600 pages and, and connects everything to, you know, the overall plot. And much of that is, you know, I've, I've read some of that material. I'm a very prolific reader, so I've read some of that mm-hmm. material just out of curiosity. And some of it is clearly just really out there, and some of it just <laughs> kind of makes your head spin. And some of it at the same time, and it's, well, you know, there's some politicians I could look at it and say, well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe. <laughs> uh, yeah. You do wonder. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing, the thing that's intriguing about it, however, is that it does cause a reaction among people and you know they either shut it down automatically from discomfort or you know they're repelled by it or just the very idea but you know at the same time if we go back to biblical tradition i mean what started all the trouble to begin with (laughs) was a snake in the garden so you have to kind of wonder what is the effect on people's consciousness in terms of this concept of there being a reptilian race. And, you know, when you see things like, uh, I don't know if you guys ever have ever seen the artistic concept of a, a modern dinosaur, if they had evolved. Have you ever seen that mm, drone? No, no, no. I'll have to see if I can and find it and send it to you. You can probably Google it and uh, see it. And it's, it, it's a guy who was, uh, you know, studying and looking at the idea of if the dinosaurs had survived and continued to evolve, uh, what would they look like today? And he came up with this reptilian, you know, <laughs> this is a bipedal reptilian looking creature. And it's, it's kind of unsettling. And, you know, you look at cases that you hear from different segments uh, of, you know, investigations around the world. You know, sometimes you hear UFO related cases, of course, that talk about reptilians. And then you get things that are off the wall, like the lizard man in South Carolina, mm-hmm. you know, that reportedly was this bipedal lizard creature, you know, living in scape or a swamp. So 
it lingers out there just enough, and there's just enough of it, I think, to be unsettling in that it's a potential. Does that make sense? Something I heard Russell Targ say in reference to remote viewing and, and uh, psi abilities is that when you present this to the larger scientific community, who, of course, generally does not accept most all of this, and you present them with the data from laboratory conditions, it's not the data they have a problem with, it's the implications of that data. Right. My connection here to the anecdotal stories about lizard people is that, okay, so you saw somebody uh, in the story, the woman's wig fell off and she had a you know, snakeskin scalp. And uh, this family's just the weirdest thing. It's like, yeah, they could be human, but what human would live like that? Uh, as as evidenced, uh, you know, by the neighbor's um, casual investigation. And that you can accept. It's like, okay, I believe this guy saw something really weird. Maybe they are some kind of uh, otherworldly being that is more hybrid lizard slash human-like. But then you can't accept the implication that they're out to somehow dominate the world or infiltrate humanity for some sinister reason. And I think that's the leap that most people, uh, they can't make that association because like you said, the implications are, are just too frightening to consider. Which is more prevalent, lizard people sightings or something of a black-eyed people nature? Well, gosh, I, I think in, in recent years, probably the black-eyed children mm-hmm. of black-eyed people. But you know, to a certain degree, I think that also can be attributed to the fact that more attention has been put on them. And, right. you know, more people are, are sort of paying attention. And that loops back around and basically the question, you know, how much are we contributing to the creation of this phenomena from where we are? Uh, but, you know, in terms of, of these other cases that relate to reptilians, I think that you made a good point because you're talking about the connection now to modern conspiracy theory and this idea of a reptilian race hiding in the shadows. So that alone makes a lot of people go away from looking at the phenomena at all. And right. we sort of have point A and then we have point X, right? You know, we, mm-hmm. we're, we're missing all the data in between, which is something I, that I kind of tried to address in that chapter in Strange Intruders because... I didn't really go into all this conspiracy idea that they're running world governments. I, I, that wasn't wasn't my interest. What I wanted right. to look at were some of these weird cases that have cropped up over the years that uh, you know the the witnesses say were some kind of reptilian looking being. And uh, you know those are the cases that kind of covers point B and and you know all the way up to X because if we start looking at those, then we do have to question. Well, is there something else here that we're not quite aware of? Is there something else going on? Uh, you know, what what explains these cases? You know, because mm-hmm. it's not just one. I mean, you know, there are just a uh, cursory look. You'll find, you know, several of them that are very curious. And those are the ones that I find very intriguing. Well, the story that you put in the book about Pierre Fortunato Zanfretta, that story was, mm-hmm. I was just like, what is, how have I not heard of this? You know, and as I'm looking into it, I was looking at the Wikipedia page earlier today. And it, of course, that's a very skeptical uh, operation over at Wikipedia, or a lot of pages seem to be trending that way lately, we've noticed over the past couple of years. But they've been changed. They've been scrubbed uh, recently. Yeah, yeah of, some of the stuff we been. looked at, the sites of the pages have been radically changed. But this one, this even this page is, is supportive. And it, at, towards the end, it mentions uh, that in an investigation, they were able to find 52 witnesses who also claimed to see this craft that Sanfreda talks about, but what is, I don't even know what the question to ask about. <laughs> that is there a question I, in I'll there? tell you, you know, um, I was recently, I don't know if you guys saw, you guys saw on the trail of UFOs. Yeah, we were going to talk about, uh, or just at least mention it. Uh, we really enjoyed your appearance in uh, Seth Breedlove's uh, Small Town Monsters. Thank you. Film. Yeah, I had a great yeah. time working with those guys. And, um, you know, I, I, I know they asked me during the course of filming that, you know, what was, uh, I forget how it's phrased, you know, basically what's, you know, what's one of your favorite cases or something. I've been asked that question before, and this is the one that always comes up for me because, uh, you know, I, I'm so intrigued by this case. And I've, I've spent a fair amount of time in Italy, a beautiful country. You know, I've tried to delve into it a little bit when I'm, when I've been there too. 
it's a case that is just not very well known, despite the various components that are just amazing about it. This is a case that, that began, at, first of all, as multiple encounters. Uh, it started in 1978 in December of that year. And uh, Zanfredo was a security guard at the time. Uh, Zanfredo was responsible for checking on homes of people who were, you know, out of town or not there at the time. And uh, just making sure that, you know, the place hadn't been broken into, or, you know, that shady was going on. And he had gone to check on a doctor's house in a small Italian village. And he got there at night. And when he arrived, he saw lights moving on in the garden of the home. So he immediately thought... Oh, there's thieves trying to break into the house. So uh, he got his revolver out and a flashlight in hand. And, you know, he follows the wall. It goes back around to the, the other side of the house. And his plan, obviously, is to get the drop on these uh, would-be robbers. Well, he ends up with quite a surprise because when he gets to the area, he doesn't see thieves, but he he sees what... The description always gets me. His description was that they were enormous, green, ugly, frightful creatures with undulating skin. And you kind of have to let that sink in for a minute. And just think about <laughs> yeah. that. They vaguely sound reptilian, you know, from his description. And the thing is, is that, of course, a whole lot of other events happen in the aftermath of this. Uh, you know, Sanfredo, he, he calls for help. Uh, they send back up out to the location, and, and when the other officers arrive, they find Zinfredo just is kind of hysterical. He's laying on the ground. He jumps up, and he, you know, he's, he almost fires at him. I mean, there's all these things that go on. But in the aftermath, when the place was investigated, they found these weird, what they described as landing marks on the property behind the house. They they were horseshoe shaped. And not only that, but 52 residents, 52 other people in that village reported seeing these weird lights in the sky in that area and over the doctor's house, uh, heading towards the doctor's house right before this encounter. So, you know, the intensity of this case is just, it's mind boggling. You know, as it unfolds, uh, Zanfreda has other encounters. The Italian military police end up investigating the case and one of my favorite aspects of this case is that the Italian military police end up closing the case and they rubber stamp the file, no crime committed. That's all they'll say. <laughs> because they didn't have an explanation for what was going on. And just bizarre things. I mean, they, you know, they find him at one point, he's you know, in the freezing rain and his car is hot as an oven and he's dry and just all these bizarre things. They find a giant footprint at one point they can't explain. And, you know, this is not just a couple of random UFO investigators poking around and getting evidence. I mean, this was a serious investigation that was carried on for quite a bit of time. The military police, they didn't even close the case until oh, it was about two years. It was, it was early 1980. When they closed the case. So, you know, they looked at it for, you know, around a year and a half, I guess is what it amounted to. But what a strange, strange and fascinating case. On the cold night of December 6th, 1978, 26-year-old Pierre Fortunato Zanfreda had the first in a series of bizarre encounters with otherworldly creatures. Zanfredo was employed as a private security guard and was on patrol in the small Italian village of Torelia. Traveling carefully on the icy roads, Zanfredo was on his way to check on the empty home of Dr. Ettore Righi when his car suddenly died. The Fiat's engine, lights, and radio all went off at the same moment not far from the Righi home. Zanfredo spotted four lights moving around the garden of the home and believed thieves were attempting to break into the house. Revolver and flashlight in hand, Zanfreda slipped into the home's open gate and followed a rock wall toward the lights, hoping to surprise the would-be thieves. It was Zanfreda, however, who received the surprise. Preparing to leap out at the criminals, the young guard felt something touch his shoulder from behind. Whirling around, he was confronted, not by a human thief, but by a frightening creature that he later described as quote, an enormous, green, ugly, and frightful creature with undulating skin, as though he were very fat or dressed in a loose gray tunic 
no less than 10 feet tall. Zanfretta later stated the creature had greenish skin and yellow triangular eyes and red veins across the forehead. The creature also had points on the side of its face. Many in UFO circles believe this was an example of what has come to be called a reptilian or reptoid. After rushing away from the weird creature before him, Zanfretta reached his car only to see a bright light rise up behind him. Looking over his shoulder, he observed a massive, flat, triangular-shaped craft emitting a blinding light. The craft was bigger than the house it was rising over. A blast of heat rolled over the guard as he struggled to the radio in his car. At 12.15, he reached the security company's radio operator, Carlo Tocolino. Tocolino listened to Zanfretta, but at first he couldn't understand the incoherent ramblings coming from the guard. It was clear Zanfretta was very excited. The operator heard him repeating, My God, are they ugly! He asked the guard to calm down and describe the men who had assaulted him, at which point Zanfretta replied, No, they aren't men. They aren't men. Then suddenly, the communication ended. The company's security chief promptly sent another patrol car to the location. Foul weather and dangerous driving conditions made it difficult to reach the site, and an hour had passed before the second car arrived. The guards, Walter Loria and Raimondo Masia, arrived at 1.15. They found Zanfretta lying in a prone position in front of the house. Seeing the two men walking towards him, Zanfretta leapt up and pointed his revolver at them. Seeing his panicked state, the two guards rushed Zanfretta before he could harm them or himself. The two men later stated that despite the fact he had been lying on the frozen ground, Zanfretta was warm. The Carabinieri were called to the scene to investigate. The Carabinieri, the Italian police, were called to the scene to investigate. They found strange marks on the ground behind the house. It was clear something large and heavy had left the two impressions. The marks were nine feet in diameter and shaped like horseshoes. Some speculated that they were landing marks from a UFO. During the investigation, 52 residents of the village reported seeing bright lights emanating from the direction of the Rigi house that night. Reporters got wind of the story and the press had a field day, many making fun of it, at least those who would cover a UFO story. Some simply reported the incident as it was recounted. Others were more brutal, calling Zanfretta everything from a mental case to an outright liar. However, one reporter took the incident seriously. Rino de Stefano was working for Il Corriere Mercantile, the local Genoa daily newspaper. Di Stefano found the case intriguing and wrote several articles chronicling the events. Not only were there 52 other witnesses to the UFO's lights, the reporter also found it unlikely that Zanfretta, a father of two and a reputed honest man, would make up such a story. As Di Stefano wrote, Zanfretta didn't want to be famous. He refused the notoriety because he was worried about his job and his family. Trying to understand what he had gone through and uncover more of the facts, Zanfretta agreed to undergo hypnosis. Dr. Moro Moretti, a psychotherapist and member of the Italian Association of Medical Hypnosis, conducted the sessions. Under hypnosis, Zanfretta recalled more details of his weird experience, learning that not only had he encountered aliens, they had also abducted him. Further details emerged from Zanfretta while under hypnosis. He said the creatures didn't speak to him in Italian, but used a luminous device to translate their own language. Disturbingly, Zanfretta also said the creatures, from a planet in the third galaxy, want to talk with us and that they will soon return in large numbers. The saga of Pierre Zanfretta doesn't end there, though. He had yet another encounter with aliens on the evening of December 26th. On a rain-soaked road near the Scafera Pass, the guard lost control of his car, not due to the slick pavement, but due to something taking over the controls. A panicked call on his radio once again sent assistance his way, but not before he radioed back reporting, quote, the car has stopped. I saw a bright light, now I'm getting out, end quote. An hour later, Zanfretta was found in a nearby field by officers who had answered the call. Despite the pouring rain, Zanfretta was warm and dry. The Carabinieri found themselves again investigating a scene involving this lone security guard. Zanfretta's Smith & Wesson revolver was recovered and five bullets had been fired. 
the guard claimed he had no recollection of using the weapon. When the Carabinieri examined Zanfretta's car, they noted it was hot as an oven inside and out, despite the cold rain. Even more puzzling, the car was surrounded by shoe prints that measured 20 inches long by eight inches wide. A bare spot was obvious between the sole and heel of the prints, but no one could offer any explanation for the tracks. Since shots had been fired at the scene, the Carabinieri launched a probe into the incident and issued an official report. The data was collected on January 3rd, 1979. It seemed no one really knew what to do with the information. A year later, January 11th, 1980, the papers were rubber stamped with no crime committed and filed away. While the Carabinieri were reviewing the case file, they informed both the Italian Department of the Interior and other military commands. They rated the reliability of Zanfretta's weird accounts as good. In 1978, Italy was having a massive wave of UFO sightings. Interest was at a high point and the military and government were both paying attention. Zanfretta became a bit of a celebrity, but he still didn't like the attention that was focused on him. He agreed to another hypnosis session, this time allowing it to be televised in an attempt to show he was not a mental case. In a trance state, Zanfretta related his bizarre tale of an alien encounter and abduction. Viewer numbers were in the hundreds of thousands, but the show didn't have the effect Zanfretta was hoping for. Skeptics merely used the show to add fuel to their fire, and it took a long while for the attention to finally die off. Zanfretta was examined by a prominent neurologist from Genoa who pronounced him perfectly sane, but in a state of shock. The attention on the security guard had grown well beyond the borders of Italy, with stories of his experiences appearing in media around the world. It was months before attention on the case started to die down, but yet again, Zanfretta's tale was not finished. The guard was abducted again on the night of July 30th, 1979. This time, he was riding a motorcycle in a residential neighborhood in Genoa. Again, he was found by fellow security officers, this time at the top of Mount Fasce. After this abduction, Zanfretta had another hypnosis session. At his own request, Zanfretta was injected with a truth serum prior to the session. Under these conditions, the guard affirmed all of the previous information he had given about his abductions was true and that during the last encounter, he had been taken to a spaceship by a green light. Professor Marco Marchesen, who injected the man with the truth serum, stated, no human being can knowingly lie while he is under pentothal treatment. So I think it's very probable Zanfretta had these encounters. A few months later, December 2nd, 1979, Zanfretta was taken again. Other officers on patrol reported spotting a UFO and one even fired his revolver at it to no avail. As if Zanfretta's encounters couldn't get any stranger, the details that emerged from this latest incident introduced a new element, a grinning man. Stopping at a self-service gas station in Genoa, Zanfretta climbed out of his patrol car only to hear someone calling for him. In the shadows outside of the station was a strange figure. According to Zanfretta, the man was a tall, human-looking figure with a bald, egg-shaped head. He was dressed in a checkered suit and wore what appeared to be a steel breastplate instead of a shirt. The grinning man's voice compelled Zanfretta to do as he was told. He was commanded to drive his car into a cloud hovering just above the ground nearby. Once inside the cloud, the entire car was lifted and transported into a spaceship. During one of his last abductions, the aliens gave Zanfretta a mysterious object. It was a large transparent sphere with a pyramid inside. Sparks discharged and jumped from the vertices of the pyramid towards the inside of the sphere. The beings told Zanfretta that with the sphere, it was possible to understand them and how they lived. During a hypnosis session, Zanfretta recounted that he didn't want to take the sphere. He told the aliens he was finished and wanted nothing more to do with them or the sphere. They were insistent, however, and told Zanfretta he was to give the sphere to a man named Dr. J. Allen Hynek. Zanfretta claimed to have no idea who Hynek was. Hynek was best known for his UFO research and his part in the U.S. government's Project Blue Book, an attempt to discredit UFO sightings. Pressed further about the mysterious sphere and pyramid, Zanfretta stated he hid the object in the hills outside Genoa and that he is waiting. 
Hynek passed away in 1986. So if the sphere was truly supposed to go to him, the opportunity has been lost. Zanfretta was abducted two more times, once in February of 1980 and later the same year in August. His last hypnosis sessions took another weird turn when he began to speak in what was believed to be an alien language a portion of the time. He was out of control and would not cooperate with Dr. Moretti, who was conducting the session. One of the last things he communicated in English was, quote, to believe or not to believe doesn't mean anything. Each thing in its own time. That's going to wrap up tonight's show. A very special thanks to our guest, David Weatherly. We're dark next week, but we'll be back the week after that with more spooky stories. Don't miss it. Please remember to support our sponsors. They help keep the show free and the lights on in Blanket Fortiana. Special thanks to John Bolin. Hi, I'm Martin Osborne. My name is Jordan Birch. Galaxy-wide in perpetuity. I understand this is with no implied promise. C-H-A-N-D-O-N. Our show is edited by Sarah Voorhees Wendell and co-produced by Tess Feifel, who is also our head of research. Our theme, which is available as a ringtone, was composed by Judson Crane, and our sound design and additional composing is by Ryan McCullough. Special thanks to the Astonishing Research Corps. But most importantly, we want to thank you, our listeners. Visit our store at astonishinglegends.com or interact with us and other listeners on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can also support the show at patreon.com slash astonishinglegends, where patrons have access to additional bonus content. No part of this show may be reproduced anywhere without permission. Copyright Astonishing Legends Productions. Good night. (laughs) 